my therapist would encourage me to do, you know, the deeper, more, more painful work. Well, turned out there was one easy supplement that I needed to take, and but all my health problems went away. Once I started taking grass-fed beef organ capsules, all my health problems went away. So two years ago, I regained my life. Like, I was hobbled by what many doctors call chronic fatigue syndrome from age 21 until age 55. And prior to 21, I also often had debilitating problems with fatigue and illness. All my health problems went away just taking this one supplement. So I've had this, this belief in that there's a supplement out there for me, you know, virtually my entire life because I knew something was broken in me. Something wasn't working in me. My life wasn't engaged. It wasn't on track. There was just something I was missing. And I also believed that, that that something was out there and I just had to get a big enough audience, reach enough people, connect with enough people and someone would come along and suggest. And so luckily I developed this great relationship with Amazon. And then I think one day Amazon suggested to me grass-fed beef organ capsules within two weeks, all my chronic fatigue problems went away. I mean, I got my life back two years ago. It was such a dramatic you know, life and death change in the level of my vitality. And so basically I started taking grass-fed uh, beef organ capsules and I also take cranberry extract so that uh, I, I don't know how to talk about the benefits of cranberry extract in, in a classy 19th century Victorian gentleman manner, which is exactly what I'm known for. So I'll just leave it there. So those are basically the only supplements I, I take anymore. I knew there was something wrong. There was something wrong. But that's also why I was holding out for a hero. That's also why I was like particularly vulnerable to a guru such as Dennis Prager, why I'm vulnerable to cults, why you know I did this dramatic religious conversion. That there was you know a, a loathing inside me for who I was and a desire to transform myself, to leave behind this unwanted self and to remake myself in the image of a guru or a, a new community that there was just someone out there who could fix me. And I think thousands of people have felt the same way about Dennis Prager or Reverend Sun Young Moon or, I don't know, maybe Eric Weinstein for some people or, or Jordan Peterson, that uh, a lot of people feel broken. And then there's this guru-type uh, figure who comes along and they, they feel happier when they, they listen to him. Like, a lot of people, you know, experience depression then they listened to jordan peterson they cleaned their room they followed some of his basic life advice and it seemed to dramatically improve the quality of their life and so they developed this uh intense relationship with jordan peterson so i would say my yearning for a supplement solution my yearning for one easy fix for my psychological problems uh comes from the same you know broken place yearning for yearning for a cult yearning for one easy fix, All right? Yearning for the easy way out. That has characterized my life. All right, a little bit more here from Robert Wright talking with Mickey the Kaus. Course, Bob. That was a couple of episodes ago. Where does he find a, uh, uh, my free, my Buddhism course, the Coursera course you, you, you receive in reply includes the URL of the course. I, I, um, there are a couple of things I forgot to say about the whole concatenation of uh, Trump indictment and Biden scandals. Mm -hmm. one, is, one is that this Petraeus uh, prosecution, which ended in a misdemeanor plea, uh, is how Obama knocked Petraeus out of the race. He was a potential rival. So it just, I think we underestimate, yeah. underestimate the extent to which uh, people who are president like to eliminate their rivals by charging them with uh, failing to handle classified information correctly. There's that precedent. The second thing is the uh, the, the Biden, uh, sort of the scandal that the right is saying that this whole thing is designed to ignore. Uh, I thought I was overplaying it because I thought, well, what what does the what do the Republicans have that's any different from the dossier? You know, the, the dossier was about the second information that said maybe Trump pissed on had some prostitutes piss on a bed that Obama had slept in. Maybe Trump was you know promised money if he'd sell out, uh, you know, sell out Ukraine to the Russians or sell out various things to the Russians. But it was all just just gossip gleaned from like what people were speculating about. Well, this is a little better than that. This is allegedly they have a confidential source with a track record who has talked to the head of Burisma, who boasted that he'd given five million dollars to bribe the Biden. Now, uh, and I think I think it's somebody who talked to that source, or it is the source directly. So wait, who's sure reporting? Who's reporting that, that this source says this? Well, this is in an FBI form that the Republicans okay. have been trying to get that the FBI won't won't release, but it has let them view. And it's a, a, it, 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 so there there are a bunch of ways there. It could be bullshit. It could be the yeah. head of Burisma was bullshitting the source. It could be the source is bullshitting the bullshit. FBI, or it yeah. could be the guy who claims to have talked to the source is bullshitting the FBI. So it could all be bullshit. But um, it's it's a little better than the six degrees of separation of the dossier, and. Uh, 
they've now come up with a quid pro quo. They've now come up with a quo. Apparently, uh, they claim that Biden did push for some uh, some oil and gas deal that benefited Burisma after he'd gotten rid of this prosecutor who hmm. wasn't really going after them. But put that aside, after he got the five million, he did do something that they liked. So hmm. uh, the makings of a genuine scandal are there. I'm not saying it's a scandal yet, but Biden reacting testily anytime anybody mentions it is a not an indication of confidence. You know, I'm almost surprised given the amount of concern, which I personally think is legitimate, about uh, Biden's viability as a general election committee, I'm almost surprised that there hasn't been more made of the Burisma stuff, you know, by people other than uh, Republicans who hate Biden, you know? Well, well like I say, I, I mean, nobody this, wants to do it publicly, I guess, is the problem. But a lot of people summer, want to get out. This summer, they will do it publicly. That's What kind of people will start doing it publicly? That, yeah. And, and the other thing is, of course, it, it casts the impeachment in a in a different light. If there really was something there that Trump was trying to bully Zelensky into investigating, it makes the impeachment look even stupider than it was. So the Democrats have a lot invested in in Biden being innocent of the Burisma thing. Um, yeah, in, in retrospect, that that uh, impeachment really paved the way for uh, not just the Ukraine intervention, but possibly the war in the sense that, you know, it accelerated the flow of weapons to Ukraine. And I don't think it's completely crazy to think that that was uh, one of the triggering mechanisms. That, that That's one thing that freaked uh, that was, Putin out. It was all of a piece. It was all the interagency consensus wanted this to happen. And, you know, how dare Trump violate the inter interagency consensus? Mm -hmm. Um. The uh, so who do you think? What kinds of people do you think will? That's a, a great point. The Trump impeachment, uh, the outrage at Trump for violating the blob, the foreign policy establishment's perspective on we have to arm Ukraine, is what led, you know, is what put us in the position for the Ukraine war. We'll start speaking out this summer. And I, I'm not someone who thinks that the personality of the presidency really makes that huge of a difference. But I do believe that if Trump had won in 2020, we would not have the Ukraine war. And the Ukraine war, of course, has raised the possibility of a catastrophic nuclear exchange above trivial levels, right? The Ukraine war is an unforced disaster, probably 10 times worse than the invasion of Iraq in 2003. It's a monumental disaster, and it would not have happened if Trump had been reelected. So... The, the personality of the leader does count for something. Usually the structure counts for the most, but occasionally the personality has some role. I, or do you just think like like organs like the New York Times will start I mean, publishing I think, a little I think more back stuff? To the, I think back to the Edwards scandal. The people who leaked onto John Edwards was having an affair with this woman, Real Hunter, were not Republicans. They weren't people on the right. They were all Democrats mm -hmm. who were worried that Edwards was going to get the nomination and then the scandal was going to come out and he was going to lose. So you have to knock him out now before he got the nomination. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's those same sort of people are going to make the same calculation about Biden, especially if they think the scandal is real and they're going to come forward. So any reporter who's worth his salt and a lot of them with the Edwards scandal were not uh, would take them up on this. Uh, I would think that, you know, the Wall Street Journal has a bunch of reporters who have already chased under the uh, under the being squelched by the editors at the top. So I think there are a bunch of real reporters at the Wall Street Journal that will do it. And mm -hmm. they're also, you know, there are dozens of excellent reporters who don't have jobs anymore because they've been laid off, you know. They got they got nothing better to do than to take up this bait. So yeah, uh, but I mean, how far can Substack get you with something like this? Well, Seymour Hirsch managed to start off the the uh, pipeline story. Uh, I guess it's been well, out of his control, but he did that from a. Yeah, it's, it's not looking so me. great for his thesis, but um, I mean, and now that's looking more and more like the Ukrainians did it. But um, yeah, well, yeah, no, you're right. If you're Seymour Hirsch, and you know, you got a big, uh, a, a very vocal and sizable constituency on your side, it can happen. So yeah, it's not crazy. Um, uh, wait, tell me, when is the last date you think? like some major uh, Democrat could declare that they're in the race and it could matter. I mean, so the first primary is what? Like, when is, it, when is the Iowa caucus? December or January? End of January, I think. Or sometime in January. Sorry, the New Hampshire is like I mean, I guess the beginning of the February or the end of January. I do we, think we, we could it, look it up. In a situation like this, we got so many doubts about the leading candidate. I can imagine a candidate catching fire pretty fast. Well, Bobby Kennedy didn't declare against Lyndon Johnson until after the New Hampshire primary, obviously. Uh, uh, things have changed, and, though, right? And he got uh, traction pretty fast. Um, yeah, you think it's going to be easier to wait till the last minute now because everything mm -hmm. moves faster. So uh, I would say you don't have to do it. You know, it, it's, it would be possible to do it after the New Hampshire primary if Biden does badly. That's that's still my template. Oh God, I wrote something I, I in the 80s can, about that, Bob. Yeah, but yeah, but you, you need a lot more money these days. I mean, supposedly, I guess who knows? Free media and potential in, in, in principle, you, you can have free media for a lot. I guess. I think money is overrated. Organization is sort of not overrated, but uh, I think you, you can you know you have, can have a party and a laptop. You can organize pretty quickly. I I want I want look to at have Gary Hart. He, Gary Hart caught fire because he finished third in Iowa. All of a sudden, people said, okay, he's the guy. But go ahead, sorry. No, I really want a viable alternative to Biden uh, by end of summer. You know, Bobby Kennedy's so far doing better than I thought. I don't know how many people in that 20% who support him have actually heard him talk or how big a liability the voice will be. You do get used to it. 
I was just very disappointed that he hadn't moved on, at least in terms of what he says publicly, from Kennedy as a, he, he didn't seem to be, you know, he didn't seem to be living in the modern era. He's reliving the Bobby Kennedy campaign of 1968. Uh, and he, you know, he, he very, makes, for, makes for a great speech, but it's not what people are looking for. No, he can, he, he, he is, uh, he focuses on the Kennedy past to, to a considerable extent. I mean, he can go on and on about how his uncle JFK would have, in fact, pulled us out of Vietnam. And he claimed that he claimed that uh, Joe Rogan, that his uncle had, the JFK had signed a document pulling us out of Vietnam. Right? Did we know a few that? Days, I, I never heard of that before. You would I mean, think Char facts like that he'd have right. I mean, Charlie Peters at the Washington Monthly always used to say that Kennedy had confided in people that he was going to pull out of Vietnam, but not mm. that he'd actually signed a document saying it. Mm. No, so I'm, I'm 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 very I was very surprised when he said that. I don't know what was he was he saying he was going to pull out after the '64 election? Was that it? No, I think it was pull out then. I don't think it was. Well, he was less. He yeah, so Bobby Kennedy Jr. strikes me as, as reckless, as very much a mixed bag, but uh, someone who's probably momentarily compelling. It's hard to think of him being a, a serious presidential candidate. Right, uh, Robert Wright, Mickey Kaus also talked on Friday night about uh, has Tucker Carlson undergone a psychotic break? Because Tucker has, has increasingly, over the past year or two, said things that are absolutely absurd, Tucker's jumped on the, the UFO bandwagon. Here's Mickey. America, your roads suck. There are Jersey barriers everywhere. He's right about that. There Talking are Jersey barriers Kennedy. everywhere, and nobody seems to feel any Tucker. urge or imperative to take them down. So Plus, if Jersey barriers are the issue, Tucker wins. But uh, it's very similar, but it's this crude money thing. And the, problem, the you know, problems of America aren't going to be solved until we have the $113 billion we're spending on Ukraine spent on what Tucker wants it spent. The problems are deep and cultural, and they do not involve money. They involve the family. They involve the society being pulled apart. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Tucker knows that, okay? He's smart enough to know he is dumbing himself down, okay? Robert Kennedy, I think, is not smart enough to know he's, but he's, he says the same pitch with the money and it's all economistic. He's not smart enough to know that that doesn't work. I think that's the difference between. Well, in other words, he does not agree with you on certain parts of ideology. That's what you mean by not smart enough is he doesn't agree with Mickey. Correct. Okay. I just want to be clear. That would be Mickey's definition of smart. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh, on. So you finally watched the first episode of Tucker. The point is Kennedy is a true believer and I don't think Tucker is. Well, yeah, I'm not sure how true a believer he is. I've always been suspicious of that on for, on foreign policy, well, but uh, the. Um, but, but so you, you watch the first me? episode. You finally watch the first episode of the Tucker thing. You agree it was a little unhinged? Where's the first, first three episodes, Bob? There's okay, a fourth well, one now. There's a fourth one now that I haven't seen, but there's three. You're ahead of me. You're ahead of me. But back to the first one, didn't he seem a little unhinged? I mean, we we revisited the him begging to be called an anti-Semite part last week. Uh, and I mean, he really he was said, he was begging for it. I don't know. He said that Zelensky was friends with BlackRock. Is that necessarily anti-Semitic? I mean, I thought it was the part where he called him rat-like, sweaty, shifty, but he a makes persecutor of, of he Christians. Makes, he makes, I think you put makes, it all together. It's only a ten-minute <laughs> show, Mickey. When you pack all that into a ten-minute show, come on. Give I me guess a break. He's, he's smart enough to know the resonance between all those things. I think but, so. Uh, but um. Uh, you know, he makes fun of Lindsey Graham's looks, too. I mean, he's a luxus. You know, what can I say? Um, but as the main thing you said, the most important part was what you said before that. He's smart enough to know. No, but look, at, at least he didn't spend all his time on that. There was the part where he said, we know, we now know that the government is concealing the cadavers of space aliens. Well, it's he very interesting. I had, I had read an article that didn't mention the, that it had this whistleblower who seemed very credible say we've uh -huh. recovered vessels of the aliens, but he didn't mention cadavers. And you would think they would, and that's because this guy, this whistleblower mentioned the cadavers in a later interview mm -hmm. uh, with, with some website. Um, and then you, uh, so, so our, our, my, uh, my follower, a little, little, Hey, little Mickey uh, was Whatever. right in, 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 in pointing this out to us. Uh, that, so that, that, and that does detract from the guy's credibility. I mean, not only, you know, because it, it, it sort of it's it's inherently less uh, rational for the aliens to send uh, actual aliens as opposed to, you know, probes. Right. So it's just if yes. you believe if you believe anal, if, anal probes, if you right? If, if, right, we don't expect the anal probe. So um, 
the uh, no, it's, it's MBAI, right? It's like it would be Chat GPT. If he said they were con concealing the cadavers of GPT, that would be one thing, because that it, presumably it would be AI. That we now know that when, before a civilization gets to a point where it can send spacecraft off to other solar systems, the AI is already running the show, right? So anyway, I, 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 do we know that? I mean, I'm kind of I'm half kidding, but not entirely. Anyway, the, 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 here's a crazy here's a crazy idea. What if oh, the good. aliens, in fact, are two tier have a two tiered race system? They're the real aliens who are like super. So I, I used to loathe Robert Wright, and I don't like how he interrupts all the time. I don't like many of his mannerisms. I have developed a strange new respect for for Robert Wright. And uh, open question: If aliens came to Earth, would you have sex? with an alien, like just something to tell your mates about. If they said, hey, what's, what's going on? What's new? You could say, oh, yeah, I had you know, full-on sex with an alien last night. Super smart and big yeah. and blobby, and they don't travel, but they have a race of servants who are sort of miniature right. who they put in the craft. Kind of like, they're, or what still, if they're just avatars? They're just make, deep fakes of the actual still, alien. Still makes no sense because the AI presumably would run the spaceships just as well as the actual aliens that are there. Uh, to, to say with certitude something that he's not certain about. Uh, yeah, but this is this is kind of really going out on a limb. We're talking alien cadavers here. I, I, so what? I, I think it's a trivial side <laughs> this, this is not like uh, saying Russia blew up the dam. I, I, <laughs> this I, is this is which has about an equal probability of being true, I would say. But this well, is what we'll, we'll, we'll we're to that. saying Russia blew up the dam is much more relevant to today's politics and UFOs. You except for this, you sent me to this crazy guy Troy, uh, who has a long series about how there's a, a an interlocking conspiracy of all these theories uh, with uh, with theosophists and. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, UFO people and, and people who believe that there's an ascended elite that knows all these things and all these all these conspiracy conspiracies sort of all part. They all buy into the, all the conspiracies and they're all part of an interlocking web. And the result is a threat to democracy. That's the part that I don't now, get. I don't think look, that guy is much more paranoid than any of the paranoids he's writing about. I have a repost. I have a devastating okay. repost. But why don't we save it to the well, paranoid? No, let's let's have the devastating repost. We're on the top. Okay, I just forwarded you an email that had been forwarded to me that had that thread. But, but uh, the, I mean, I didn't like study up on the guy, but I read his thread enough to know what was interesting uh, to me. And he, and he wasn't, and you're overstating it. He wasn't, oh, there's a vast conspiracy. He was saying two things. I mean, the main thing to me was, he's a guy who had kept track, and I think this part is reliable, of people who had been on this UFO bandwagon for a long time. Right. And they included the... So everyone who's believing in, in UFOs just strikes me really poor epistemics, bro. Like really poor level of evidence. It's almost all based upon uh, video or pictures that could be, have have other explanations or fakes or someone's, you know, firsthand experience. So I'm very much on the skeptical side with regard to UFOs. Two people who uh, two of the three people who wrote the original New York Times piece that brought all this stuff back to life years, several years right. ago. Now, that piece, I think, was solid because they also threw Helene Cooper. Uh, like, uh, no, it wasn't solid. That's absurd. Like a Pentagon correspondent or something on that case. So she was with, she was part of the byline. Right. And I think the shit was solid. And I'm not saying it wouldn't have been without her. But those those are, I didn't realize, like like when we first heard about this whistleblower, it's like, uh, and, the, and the piece about him is written by two former New York Times people. Okay, well, now I, we know they've been on the UFO bandwagon for a long time, which I didn't really realize. That was what was interesting to me. And that's my, that's, that was the only reason I forwarded that thread. Then the oh, guy did go on to say, no, he did go on to say, it is a trope in various kinds of anti-government rhetoric. I forget if he said on the right or left or both that, you know, they're concealing shit from us and the UFO thing uh, stuff works. Yeah, just because New York Times reporters are taking UFOs seriously doesn't make UFOs a serious consideration, right? New York Times reporters are often completely out to lunch. Into that well, and I think he's right about that. Tucker's a perfect example. He's a perfect example. Well, That's if, what if he's appealing to is anti-government paranoia. If you, right, if you believe in one conspiracy, you're more likely to believe in another conspiracy. I agree, if you're an anti-vaxxer, if you believe in UFOs, you're more likely to believe that the vaccines are a, a, a plot by the drug companies. That, I understand that. It's when he says, and therefore they're a grave threat to democracy. That's so I saw my old friend Josh Randall, I was doing a stream Friday evening with Dennis Dale just before Shabbat. And just before I, I left the stream, Josh Randall stopped by. I haven't, you know, had him on any of my streams. He left after I was a, a bit of a jerk to him, what, a year or two years ago? And I, I subsequently privately apologized to to Josh for, for being a jerk. But, uh, you know, another stalwart of the show who's like washed his hands and, and moved on. It's like, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to be a part of the show anymore. But it was, you know, great to have a little bit of interaction with Josh Randall Friday evening. And I was saying that... Uh, you know, much of conservatism is based on a con of shilling supplements. And Josh Randall had a great response. Well, what about the left and pharmaceuticals? 
So establishment conservatism and the center and the left are you know, largely underwritten by pharmaceutical companies. My answer to Josh would be that pharmaceuticals are far more regulated than supplements. So supplements, you can, you know, you can make far wider cl claims on a much you know, weaker basis of evidence than you can with, with pharmaceuticals. But certainly many pharmaceuticals have been approved and are being promoted and being prescribed in a ways that are bad for people. So it seems to me that uh, right now, if I had to weigh things up, uh, kind of 50-50, but uh, no, nah, it seems to me that supplements are more of a con game right now in, in America than pharmaceuticals. But I'm very open to being wrong here. A, I, he I, does I, say that. He does say that. Read the whole thread. And therefore, they're a great threat to democracy. Yeah, and it, 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 and he, so he's, he goes off the deep there. And uh, uh, what, what he doesn't say is, is this whistleblower, this card And let's say hello to Elliot Blatt. What's going on, bro? Uh -oh. How's it going, Elliot? Blessings to Elliot Blatt, who can't hear me. I just heard an uh-oh from Elliot. Where's the mother talked about who seems so credible, yet does talk about cadavers. Is he a theosophist who also believes in drug conspiracy? Is he part of this vast network? The theosophy thing is wild. You know who was, if I understand theosophy, if I'm not mixing it up with something else, it was this guy, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, what is it? There's the Waldorf schools and the other kind Rudolf of school. Steiner, he was anthroposophy. Yeah. He replaced theosophy with a oh, man-centered man view which was anthroposophy, I believe. Oh, he's, but he's in the theosophy lineage? He's a, yeah, he's a spin-off, yeah, I think. I have yeah, so friends, well, the Waldorf I have friends schools, who are part of that. You know, the, the Waldorf schools give, like, part of their philosophy is that you should give very young children the dolls they play with, like, two years old, three year old. Hello? Should not. Elliot Blatt, what's going on, bro? Oh, all right, I couldn't hear you last time, Luke. Uh, sorry. I don't know if it was on my end of urine, sorry. Blessings. Um, uh, blessings. Early blessings. Yeah, this is a Started early. great uh, opportunity to I woke up to, to see Stephen leaving, so um my bad had a nice restful sleep oh lucky so you, uh so look i uh, i uh had a little journey yesterday Beautiful. i went to uh the outskirts you know i got outside of the metro bubble you know yeah uh just to see what life was like you know i had a birthday party to go to beautiful and it's aliens bro <laughs> it's weird out there <laughs> um it's a different culture out there man uh we got problems. But what do you mean? Get specific. Did I lose you again? I'm I'm here, but Luke, you, I'm not you... hearing anything. Okay, sorry. Let me, um... Oh okay. boy. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I it's on my end. Hang on. Hang on. Hang um, on. Okay, speakers. All right. Um, Shalom. Blessings. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, microphone. Let me see. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Um. Hmm. This is on this is on my end. So okay, microphone, uh, that's right. And then did you hear that uh, music playing? Huh. Speakers testing microphone. I don't know why. Okay, I'm coming through. The the audience can hear me. The audience can hear me, but Elliot can't. So I don't know what's what's going on there. Sorry about that. Uh, try try to come back, Elliot, if you can. I have faces. They should not have faces. Okay. They have a bunch of weird beliefs. Um, mm. But okay, anyway, well, I, it, it was a weird. It's a weird group to include in this vast conspiracy. Anyway, okay. we were talking about Tucker. Yes, he's, he's a fucking nut. He, he okay, we agree. Let's talk about you. He seems to have bought the UFO Kool Aid. Yes. Oh, I don't know if he has. I don't give him that much respect. My, my point is just that when I said it's not like saying the Russians blew up the dam, uh, it's another, that doesn't convince people that you're crazy, right? This convinces people he's crazy, even though I think it's just uh, reckless opportunism or something. You know, the, 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 this guy we were talking to on Twitter that you mentioned uh, did say, and he was a Tucker fan. He said, I thought he, I think he's had a psychotic break after watching the first episode. And, and I don't think he has, but, but I think it was, it was weird enough for non-crazy people to say, is he having a psychotic break? You watch the whole thing, it's fucking weird. The weird Zelensky shit. Well, it is, it is weird. UFO cadavers. That's fucking weird. It is. It's a lot weirder than the stuff he was writing for the Daily Caller. And it wasn't exactly that he was restrained by the editors of the Daily Caller since he owned and ran the Daily Caller. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it, nobody was restraining him, and yet his pieces were very respectable and nuanced. And this is all very unsubtle and a little crazier. And you wonder if it, I think he is being cynical about it. But uh, uh, the UFO thing, I think he actually believes because um, the government has been more open about UFOs than it has been before. So there, there's well, a, a there's be real. A, 
yeah, there's a trend there. Yeah, could be real. Sure, and there's interesting suggestive evidence. This David Fravor okay. pilot, he's right. interesting. Okay. Okay. But um, what, what it is to me is Tucker, he's sort of been forced by getting fired to uh, carve an alternative to cable news. And his latest, uh, latest episode, which I didn't see, is all about how cable news is doomed. So presumably he is the wave of the future. And he might also decide the same thing about political parties. You know, we have these two parties, they're doomed, time for a third alternative. I'm just saying well, there would be a actually, harmonic convergence of his entire worldview if he either supported a third party run for president or mounted one himself. Goes for the alien vote. See, that's what I mean. This is nuts. If you're, if you're, well, it depends. If you just want to pick up seven percent and cause a ruckus as an independent and swing the election, sure, go, go alien. Um, the uh... okay, I think that's uh, enough from that show. How to tell a critic from a troll? This is Andrea with bangs and uh, Chris Cavanaugh and Christian Pastor Paul Vanderclay. And and it is almost certainly the case when I hear like any discussion about this topic in um the the kind of. I, I'm not saying that you're a part of this ecosystem, but I tend to refer, you know, the kind of sense-making sphere. Um, and I, a lot of the discussion of religion is around the the ritualistic, the community, the, you know, traditional okay, symbolic interpretationism. Uh, but... One more time with Elliot Blatt. What's going on, bro? All right. How about now? I can hear okay. you loud and clear. How about me? I can. Uh, it's nothing uh, but love all the way around, bro. No, I spoke too soon. No, we You're can gone. hear you. We can hear you, bro. Oh, I'm gone. I heard you for a split second, and then you're gone, Luke. Uh, Give your story, bro. Yeah, uh, Earth to Luke, Earth to Luke, come in, Luke. Story. Give yeah. Give your story, yeah. bro. Yeah. I'll hang on for a few more seconds here. No, just you were there, and then you were gone. So I, I don't believe it's on my end. Okay. All right. Ten, nine. Eight, I grew seven, up an Irish Catholic. Six, I'm very familiar five, with those positive four, aspects of religion. Three, I'm also very two, familiar All right, with next time we'll potential have to, we'll have to negative it. impacts right, of religious institutions and communities and their ability to suppress, oppress, and to damage people. And and in many occasions, it's it's actually the religious institutions and religious people that betrayed, in a in a sense, the belief that people had in those okay. things. And that's not a small aspect right mm -hmm. and it, it kind of i i sometimes feel like there's a kind of unnecessary uh like barrier drawn between religious and and non-religious whereas the vast majority of religious and non-religious people i know are you know they're getting along in the world they're they're looking for meaning they're looking for stuff that they value but they they recognize that there are good and bad things and that applies to as much religion as public health measures and and trade-offs and and i'm i'm kind of i react quite strongly to things that i perceive as suggesting that um if you lack the the religious impulse that there's something fundamentally missing or that you know your your life is you're, you're denying in essence that you actually are religious because everybody fundamentally is and and i see that as like a sort of implicit thing that materialism sucks the life and meaning out of the world and that we want to re-inject the the spiritual and the metaphysical but but in that contrast and this way i would say to the new atheist so you asked andrea you know how I, i'm i'm why i'm uh i would distinguish myself from the new atheist and, and part is because I actually study religion words lots of the new atheists don't um but the 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 other part is that i i don't think that inherent conflict has to exist like i i think tolerance and and uh like a willingness to recognize that people can draw meanings from different, you know, uh, like secular or religious meaning structures is is beneficial. And I'm that's why I'm like I'm quite reactive to things which are are, are presenting a secular world as, as fundamentally like cold and alienating and void of, of meaning, because I, I don't think I, I think that presents that ends up in the discussion with higher. I think I agree with Chris Cavanaugh here. Meaning primarily comes from relationships. It should primarily come from your family, your extended family, your friends and community. If he is able to be moral uh, without, you know, a, a religious structure to keep them on the straight and narrow. And I think all of those questions have been like discussed and answered in 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 hundreds of years of debates between atheists and religious people. So in in I guess in part, that's a whole bunch of things. But that's that's partly um, my reaction to that, Paul, is that I I think it is you're completely right that we should take seriously the the attachments and, and social ones and, and you know you could frame it in other language as you suggest like the you know the experience of the numinous the the like it's read the core or or being touched by the holy spirit or the, the your commitment to the sangha or whatever it might be but um in while acknowledging that i'm i'm not sure that i agree that my secular worldview requires like kind of 
uh, but that's a metaphysical reality that I can't comprehend because I feel like I comprehend it okay and that I understand people that value it. I don't personally believe in the metaphysical aspects of it, but you know, that's it, it doesn't feel that mysterious to me that that exists in human, given the kind of social beings that we are. Okay, I, Paul, I want you to take it, but but I, I have a, a little quick something just to to be clear regarding the empty desert scape of secular materialism. Um, yeah. It's not just... So this is Andrea with Bangs. She's religious, I believe. She's a, a Christian. And she, she's one of these lovely female commentators who seems like a, just a lovely, lovely person. But when she speaks, there are just rivers of words that just don't mean anything. So I'll just play a little excerpt. To secular make materialism. There's absolutely Christian materialism, like, ab like which I didn't mean to do. What the hell is Christian materialism? Like Christianity is a supernatural religion. Uh, she, she reminds me of Alex Kashuta. Babylon, <laughs> but did when I joined Twitter and talked to a bunch of scientists about science. The Church of Twitter. Meaning there. <laughs> so, so, so it's not. It's not just. It's not just secular. Like it's. It's the. Uh, she she talks and she talks, but she says nothing. Sad. Um. I mean. If you, if you add, if you say have a specific, well, what about lived experience regarding the Aboriginal way of like seeing science and like like their lived experiences that back of the turtle or like I don't know, there's a lot of back of the turtle like myths, but but re regardless, okay, th that's not what I'm meaning for lived experience. Like I I take lived experience seriously. Give me examples and and I'll I'll see how. Okay, you take lived experience seriously in in, in what context? All right, if you're if you're married to someone, you need to take their lived experience seriously. If you have strong friendships you need to you know at least treat your your friends lived experience with with some respect but if you're trying to ascertain truth about the wider world you know, various individuals lived experience doesn't mean anything oh, seriously i can't take them depending on what it is in the subject i think that um science has given us the ability to uh, my son has diabetes and a type one mm. he is 11 and has had it since he was four thank you science thank you the canadian guy who can't remember his name who came up with penicillin like thank you for insulin. thank you for that hmm? insulin Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, get get <laughs> you better get this straight, mom. <laughs> uh, are you sure your son has diabetes? I mean, you know what you're talking about. Yeah, I just said the wrong thing. Just inject them what's there. My, yeah, I inject it with whatever the pharmacy gives me, and it's the right thing. Okay. Well, that was my lived experience that was a little bit off for that moment. Um, but no, but like, so I, I, yes, I understand scientific method um, helping us medically, like, that, like such amazing, like, so many lives are saved because of the scientific method. Um, that's the most front of my brain example. Like, is it true? Well, like, like what, which, which truth are we, you know, like looking at a story and who's the hero and, and what he. <laughs> well, well, OK, sorry, I, I'm I'm bringing up more things than I took too long. So Paul, I just blather please. on and on. Well, you, you had a question about wokeness and, and wokeism. Oh, yeah, well, that, yeah. So I, I was kind of curious just about, you know, the uh, the emphasis. Yeah. So both religious people and the woke, right, similarly come from claims about their own lived experience and how these claims should be treated as sacred and should not be subject to you know, skeptical criticism. This on, on you know, lived experience and, and the kind of reductionist nature of, of science and, and secularist worldviews. The, the other group that I hear, apart from religious people uh, who advance that critique often, is postmodern uh, kind of uh, scholars, right? Yeah, they, yeah. They, and I, I'm just curious to the extent to which, on that particular point, not you know, all the broader stuff that you, you agree, or is it like, is there something that's distinctive that uh, from the critique that you would have that that diverges from that? Because you know, Jordan Peterson is often critiqued that he sounds remarkably postmodern while reeling against postmodern people. Now, oh, yeah, there's, say, a, there's a lot of postmodernity in Jordan. It depends what you mean. Right. It depends right. what right. such and such is. Right? right. That's something that's very common. So I'm I'm just curious about in that respect to what extent there's there's overlap on those points, or or whether it's it's like you know it's just a parallel evolution and there isn't actually a point of context. I'm still not sure what you're asking, but I'll try and answer. Okay. Um, there's plenty of postmodernity in me too. I think. I think. So, so if you want to sort of see this, see this long term, I see this very much within a religious frame. So, part of why the part of what during the Renaissance you have this this real fascination with sources and literary sources. I mean, Europe, certain parts of Europe start going crazy looking for Greek manuscripts and so on and so forth. Erasmus, of course, um, is is finding you know at this point in Europe, everybody's learning Greek, people are learning Hebrew, and then they're looking at Jerome's Vulgate, and they begin to recognize that hey, wait a minute. Um, I mean, today, today, a contemporary biblical scholar might accuse uh, Jerome of writing a paraphrase, because if you look at see, so what I do with my built Sunday school class, for example, is I put different English texts by next to each other, and I have a sense of the nature of this translation that 
Jerome is filling in a lot of the space in the, you know, in the, just at the late antiquity, filling in a lot of the space so that all of the doctrines are nicely there for the people reading the Vulgate, for the people reading this Latin text. And come the Renaissance, because of all the texts that have sort of been unearthed because of the Crusades, now suddenly people have access to better Greek texts and some Hebrew texts, and they're learning Hebrew from Jews. And so Erasmus takes it, and now the printing press is there. So Erasmus is, you know, lining up the Vulgate and some, you know, some Greek texts and having notes on the side, basically critiquing Jerome and saying, you know, hey, wait a minute, um, what, what's, Jerome is doing something funny with the text. And of course, as Erasmus is writing, Luther is reading. And a lot of people have accused Erasmus of laying the egg that Luther hatches. So Luther, of course, is reading this and he's following with Erasmus. Erasmus winds up staying a faithful Catholic. Luther, of course, um, he's got his own things going on in Northern Germany, sort of following Jan Hus and starts making some noise, wanting a little bit of a discussion. And if the Catholic Church is reactive, they kick back. Luther's, Luther's kind of like Jordan Peterson. Is that if you push him, you know, he gets reactive fast. And so Luther keeps amping up. Luther's prince doesn't want him um, getting burned at the stake like Jan Hus. So he protects him. But Luther very much believed that, you know, if we could get that, you really have sort of the sources of science in this way, in a religious sense, that if we can get the best text, and if we can apply reason to it, then everybody will see the world in the same way. This is Luther's great. big idea. And to Luther's dismay, it doesn't happen that way. You know, Karlstad, um, Zwingli, the Anabaptist, I mean, all hell breaks Luther in Northern Europe, and nobody quite knows what to do. But the printing press is there, the genie's out of the bottle, by the way, the generation before the New World was discovered. So suddenly everybody wants to figure out, well, how can we all get on the same page again? And so the idea, really, because they've sort of been infused with a lot of classics, Aristotle's been found, suddenly it's, well, let's see, empiricism and reason, you know, these two ideas, what we can see down below here, you know, I see a cat, you see a cat, we all see a cat, we all call it a cat, that's a cat. So, and then reason, and so and you basically have the beginning of modernity, where we're all trying to be on the same page with, with you know, with, with the stuff that we find here, I've got a can of Wilhelmina mints given to me by a very strange Jew. Um, <laughs> And so, and, and that's hopefully the way we can kind of all be on the same page, all be in the same world. And Galileo, of course, is measuring things and we're all trying to get in the same world. And, and that holds for a good long time that we can, maybe with these things, we can all stay on the same page. And of course, religion continues to adapt and religion becomes a very modernist thing. And well, we have the text and the text is going to be sort of the thing we can all agree on for the most part. We'll argue about interpretations, but, and, and of course, the religious institutions continue to, to bear weight, but, you know, go up and down during the modern period. Well, of course, in post-modernity, people sort of get to the end. Modernity really sort of reaches its peak at the end of 19th, beginning of the 20th century. And, and people begin to realize that, yeah, we all sort of have access to the same, the same reason and empiricism more or less, but people are sure jigging them in other ways that are pretty significant for the way these civilizations are founded. And so now you, now you begin to get this critique, this narrative critique and say, well, people are he's some evangelical that somehow managed to stay in Toronto. And I started listening to it. It's like, uh, he's no evangelical. <laughs> and okay, well, he's a union. So. So he's talking here, a Christian pastor, Paul van der Klee, talking about his experience with Jordan Peterson. Well, that's strange to begin with. I didn't know much about Jung. So then I made a video about him. And then I start getting these emails from people. Oh, this is strange. So I start talking to people. I'm a pastor, so I talk to them about their life. And many of the conversations are in private. And so they're very transparent. And they got nothing to lose. You know, they don't know me anything. I don't know them. And I begin talking to dozens, even hundreds of these people. And I discover that the vast majority of these people, number one, were men. Well, given Jordan Peterson's audience, that's not a surprise. But the really strange thing about him was that many of them were depressed. And many of them basically told me, by listening to Jordan's biblical series, the depression lifted. And, and I'm not talking about someone who's just feeling a little blue. I'm talking about people that, I mean, medically, when I listened to what they were describing, they definitely would have been diagnosed with depression. All of the things that they're doing. And, they, and they're basically telling me, I listened to enough Jordan Peterson, and you know what? I cleaned my darn room. And I began to bathe. <laughs> I began to eat better. I began to exercise. I began to prioritize getting out of my room. And then I started doing these meetups. And so then they start coming, at least the local ones would start coming to my church. And now we're starting to have, you know, in-person conversations. Now, this is an extremely strange thing that watching those videos would have the effect on people. And it's a it's an obvious effect. Can I because I can see it that their lives are improving on all and I had the same sort of experience with Dennis Prager as my, you know, virtual father, virtual friend having a parasocial relationship with this radio talk show host. Like it felt like a lifeline during a dark period of my life. Sorts of scales that, that I can value and, and secular people could value it. And that led me to the question, what on earth is going on? And, and that led me, of course, to Peugeot was a friend of his. Peugeot was another religious guy. So we were talking about that stuff. And then Verveke and the meaning crisis, because, well, what words to, what words to describe to these guys? And when I talked to these guys, I mean, one guy, I remember, he had been religious. You know, the, the, the Sam Harris stuff, the new atheist stuff just sort of blew apart his worldview. <laughs> And then he, he gets together with a woman and she gets pregnant and, uh, you know, better marry her maybe. So he gets married to her. And then one day, and then, they, you know, they have this kid and there's two, this two-year-old running around. And he says to himself, if I listen to Sam Harris, what, what, why do I love this two-year-old so much? 
Now, he was a smart guy. Most of the people I deal with are smart people. They've, they've got college degrees. A lot of them work in tech. He said, it's more than just I'm biologically predisposed to care for my offspring. Yeah, I get that. But I just have a sense there's something more. And I think it's right in that space that as a pastor, I listen to this and I say, well, this is interesting. How does this connect to my two worlds? And, and for me, that's what this has, that's what this journey has been on. Because part of me knew that after a while, now some of them are going to sort of get lift off because they've improved some things in their body and they're not going to be as depressed. They're eating better. They're having better relationships. They're, they've got a schedule. They're sleeping better, et cetera, et cetera. So physiologically, you could say, yeah, they, they've gotten lift off. They're doing well. But for a lot of them, I knew that Jordan Peterson was on the status rocket and we're going to be talking about social wars stuff and all this. So if your life isn't working, you know, obviously you need, you need to do something different, right? If you fail doing the same thing again and again and again, right? It, it's probably a good idea to try something different, you know, even follow a, some advice from an online guru. But are the changes permanent? Are the changes permanently positive? All right. Do you get connected to good people? Do you get reconnected to reality? Stop. And for me as a pastor, I said, they probably need a community of people who can be around them to give them some support. Now, some of them have not. Gone. Yeah, I, I think most people definitely need community. If you don't have family, you got to have community. It's not good for men to be alone. Gone religious. Some of them have gone Orthodox. Some of them have gone back to Catholic Church. Some of them, I'm one guy in my meetup returned to his Sikh roots. So it's been very complex. But for me, I don't, I'm not skeptical about post-modernity. I think it is sort of an end stage of modernity. And I think a lot of the science has driven us to the fact that the world is a lot more complicated than John Locke could have imagined. And especially when we're dealing with it socially. So postmodern simply means that no one narrative is sufficient to explain life. And so some people, they get their life turned around by narratives spun by Tony Robbins or Dennis Prager or Jordan Peterson, and it helps for a while. But usually, unless you get connected to real people and create a real family or real community, right, these positive changes don't last. You, you had other kinds of transformation. And I'm in the business of transformation, as is John Verveke. And in some ways, um, you know, my relationship with John Verveke and the transformations he's seeing and the tools, that's a very complex relationship I have with John, even with Jonathan Peugeot to a degree, because a lot of people are joining the Orthodox Church. Um, I really celebrate when people join the Orthodox Church because, hey, they're part of the Christian family. Do I have ideas about Orthodoxy? Sure. But, you know, we'll let that we'll let that go for now. <laughs> but this but I'm absolutely down with you in terms of I see people leave Christianity, leave the church, leave their wives, leave their families, leave their husbands. I see people transforming all over the place. So the other guest here, aside from the pastor, is Chris Kavanaugh, who is one of the two academics behind the podcast, Decoding the Gurus. Lately, that's, I think we're in a phase right now where a lot of people are transforming. A lot of people, they're discovering this, they're discovering that, they're going to Tony Robbins. And immediately, one of the first things that they say is, this is an upgrade. Boy, I'll tell you, ever since I left Christianity, not afraid of demons. I don't worry about hell. I have my Sunday mornings back. Um, I no longer have sort of a domineering sexual ethic I have to satisfy. I don't have to worry about Jesus talking about lust of the flesh or lust of my eyes. I mean, boy, talk about liberation. This is surely an upgrade. And hey, I. Yeah. So on an empirical basis, definitely seems like some people's lives demonstrably benefit at least for a time from leaving Christianity, leaving Judaism, leaving Islam. And then, particularly if people get married and have a family, they often start coming back to organized religion and traditional ways of organizing community. I totally get that. I can feel the pressure of Christian discipleship on me. But I see these momentary transformations as fairly small things. And what's different from, let's say, a pastor from so I'm sure for many people having an adulterous fair, you know, it seems like a positive transformation of their life. They have excitement and joy and pleasure and happiness and, and dreams, and they feel like they're really living. And I'm sure, you know, the initial stages of an adulterous fair are absolutely rapturous, but is it a sustainable happiness that comes from it? From, let's say, a therapist. Does therapists look at these people in a little small box and well-being is sort of their gauge? And, you know, and so a therapist might tell you, leave that sack of dirt you're married to and get out there and have a better life. Okay. As a pastor, I'm seeing people in the wild and I'm seeing people for long periods of time and I'm seeing them in connection with their spouse and their kids and their parents and their jobs. And so for me, these heuristics are very interesting because when you walk with people over decades, you begin to, you begin to have wonderings about the, you begin to evaluate these transformations and you say, now, yeah, you don't, you're not under the Christian sexual ethic anymore. You got your Sunday mornings back. You no longer, no longer have the kind of death anxiety you had before. But these other death anxieties come in because now suddenly you have to get all of the good stuff between zero and 80. And that's it. And then you begin to notice that 
Well, now there's a certain amount of YOLO. You only live once. Boy, you know, if I'm going to get this all in, I got to get this all in. And maybe, you know, I sure hope my kids are going to be okay if I divorce that jerk, but they'll be all right. They'll get therapy. And, and you just watch this systematically. And so what happens is that your, your evaluative frame is far larger in terms of these transformative experiences. And it's not only far larger in terms of their lives, it begins to get intergenerational because actually their participation in church is going to impact their number of sex partners and their fidelity with their spouse and their relationship with their children. And, and yeah, I think he's touching on some good points here. More than religion necessarily shaping your sex life, the type of sex life that you seek is going to shape whether you're religious or not. If you want to have a lot of sexual partners, you're not likely to be religious or stay religious. If you want to settle down, be monogamous and build a family, that tends to work out much better if you're part of a religious community. So perhaps more than religion shapes your sex life, your goals and your actions with regard to your sex life will shape whether or not you're religious. Yeah, and when you watch this multi-generationally, especially, especially after you're talking to people and someone comes into your office and you hear about their parents' divorce, and then you hear about their mother's boyfriends, and then you hear about the fact that, you know, they had to go to kind of a crappy... So I dated this woman. She grew up orthodox. And then about age, when she was about four, her parents became swingers. And one day she walks in and like her mother's, you know, in bed with another man. Soon thereafter, her parents divorce. She grows up in Manhattan, half the time living with her father, who's just out there banging Amazon blondes. And she told me hell is growing up, you know, with very thin wall between you and your father, you know, banging a whole variety of, of women. So uh, the, the, the parent gets to have the, the thrills and the chills of uh, sexual experimentation, but it frequently comes at an enormous price to the children school if they went to college at all because they didn't have any money because dad and mom split up and then you start listening to these in multiple levels so my juristic is pretty broad in terms of well-being and whereas on one hand people might imagine that as a pastor i'm like yeah you know real tribal i want you in this box and i want you to act in this box in a certain way i see people who have deconstructed deconstructed from christianity and i think it's probably a good thing they did probably a good thing they did and i actually yeah if you're an empiricist you can't claim that people who leave your religion, you know, always have a, a diminished quality of life. You know, some people leave your religion and they seem to obviously have an improved quality of life, tend to be happier and finer people. I actually think that maybe 10 or 20 years from now, they're probably going to come back to their faith and they will likely have a stronger, healthier, some way sadder faith because of their deconstruction than they would have had if they had just sort of white knuckled it in the institution. And so, you know, and Good that's point. part of the reason I that's me like why but from my point of view mm -hmm. that video is an example of like a uh an uh an approach to pattern spotting heuristics which finds expression not just in like kind of jonathan's analysis of 666 but also in negative 48 so talking about jonathan Paggio's video on the number 666 which in christian numerology is the mark of the the beast numerology which is a particular QAnon follower who who disdects like uh numbers or in the da vinci code or in any number of other and you would see those as like separate in depth and, and complexity i imagine in my case i see them as a continuum of the same okay. heuristic and, and so i'm criticizing the heuristic but with a specific example and it is mean to do it to jonathan specifically mm -hmm. but i i judge from his content that he is quite open about you know being critical about specific things that he doesn't agree with and doesn't like so he put the content out and I commented on it. That's my my kind of view on it. It's I I do not intend it to be like that. Therefore, everyone has to agree in my interpretation or that I expect that he will like my engagement with his content. I know he will not like my engagement with his content. And mm -hmm. I, I kind of like factor that in. But I could approach it in a much more empathetic and nice way. And various people would say, that's the better thing to do, Chris. You know, you catch more wasps oh, with honey. Yeah. Right, yeah. But my nature <laughs> is such that this I am the same person in life as I am online and offline. And I'm a kind of argumentative, annoying person. It's, it's, it is, you know, you can ask Matt, the co-host, it's the way I'm, I'm not saying I couldn't be different. I, I could, I, I'm not saying there's no way for me not to do that. Okay. Let's uh, say hello to Elliot Blatt. Elliot, what's going on, man? Ah, uh, we still can't, now we can't hear Elliot. So, hey, hey, Luke, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm at I my can, computer yep, now. Yep. I can hear you now, bro. Hello. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, this is terrible. You can't hear me? Okay. All right, are we here? Yep, 
we're here, bro. We're live. Now I can hear you. I can hear uh, you, bro. How about Go now? Ahead. Say something. Yes, I'm here. I can hear you. We can all hear no, you. I can hear you. This is ridiculous. Okay, I'll start another Google Meet and no, 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 no. Just do. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. Uh, are you winding down anyway? I'm not sure. Oh, so, okay. Wait, if you can hear me, so I can hear you now. Okay, we're fixed. Okay, great, great. Okay, Sorry. Go for it. All right. Okay. So anyway, um, so yesterday I went to the hinterland, California, uh, um, uh, Fairfield. You know, Fairfield is about halfway between Sacramento and San Francisco. Yes, uh, no, well, it's where things get very flat, you know, it's sort of uh, it's sort of on the outskirts of both cities. It's sort of the midpoint and uh, it's quite hot, uh, it's flat. And, um, and so through uh, I have a birthday party to show go to and some it started at five, but somehow I sort of remembered it as being starting at two. So I sort of got there three hours early and uh, I had to sort of kill three hours. Uh, in the middle of the uh sacramento delta you know meth valley shall we say and um <clears throat> uh it's weird man so i i went to, i for, i just thought i need a new pair of shoes right i have i haven't got a new pair of sneakers in like three years so i figured it's time so i go to the mall in fairfield and i find a shoe store i go inside of a shoe store and um i don't know how do we say this it's it's, it's this very wakanda rich you know and and people are just you know yelling at each other at top volume you know <laughs> shrieking at each other and uh give me that size no i want this size i want that size you know and they're, 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 you got any more of these in the back and blah 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 you know on and on and on this is alien territory for me now. I feel these aren't Tucker aliens. These are social aliens. It's it was such a light, low IQ scene. Uh, and I, I said, now I understand why new Luke does Amazon. Yeah. And it's like it was rough. So I ended up scoring a pair of shoes for 20 bucks, right? Uh, I, I always go to the, you know, here's a little tip for you, Luke. Always go to the uh, clearance rack because you can usually find something for like 20% of the price, you know? So anyway, I got myself a nice $20 pair of shoes and then I left, but I still had plenty of time to kill. So I just start ambling around the mall. Like I've never, you know, I haven't, I've, I haven't been to the mall a long time. So I'm walking up and down the mall and then I, uh, I end up buying some socks, you know, I'm just sort of picking off little errands when I'm trying to kill some time. So I get a pair of socks uh, at JC Penny, you know, so I got a bag full of shoes. I got a bag full of socks and then I'm leaving feeling, feeling like I'd go for a walk in my new shoes and my new socks. I kill some more time by just leaving the mall, donning my shoes, donning my socks and just going for a walk. So on the way I'm walking, I'm retracing my steps through the mall. And, uh, so I'm walking one way and then walking towards me, is this whole phalanx of what appear to be Somalians, you know, and they're very vivacious, Luke. And like, I had this just thinking about all those Twitter videos that I'd seen. I like, uh, I just had this shot of fear that just went through my body, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, is this how I'm going to meet my end? You know, cause they were, I wouldn't say they were charging at me, but they sort of like spread out like a, like a like an alien army and they were marching towards me <laughs> and uh i really thought it was it it was just like a momentary flash but this is what being online will uh do uh you know it was a perfectly innocuous thing but i i created this uh you know <laughs> do end time scenario in my mind now has that ever happened to you yeah, of, of course, and it makes a difference. Were they were they in three piece suits? No, no, no. They were uh, they were they were dressed in you know the day's fashion. All the crap that you see at the mall, they somehow managed to acquire, which is like you sort of have to start to wonder, like, where does this money come from? Because I never see these people working. <laughs> yeah. 
What were they carrying? Are... Were they carrying Bibles? No, no, no. So they weren't coming yeah. from a Bible study. No, that no, doesn't appear so. They were well, they were killing time in the mall. Volumes of Shakespeare in their hands? No, no, afraid not. Afraid not. Because uh, if they were wearing three piece suits carrying volumes of Shakespeare and discussing the tempest, like mm. I would not feel fear. Yeah. But no, if they right. were dressed like the type of people I often see committing crime, then I would feel fear. So it depend on their dress, their demeanor. Yeah. Now, but this is true for all adolescents when they sort of yes. gang up. There's this sort of like, you know, this vivacious, spontaneous energy that they have that, you know, you, 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 you think, you know, it could sort of spiral into violence, you know, but there was a certain uh, ethnographic <clears throat> component that um, sort of doubled the ante, you know. Um, and if there were if there were uh, Somali women in their 70s, I suspect that you would not have received that shot of fear. So ethnic what? If there were Somali women in their 70s. Oh, uh, no, no, right, 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 right. No, right, so it's normal, natural, and healthy to be more aware of young men uh, of any race compared to, say, old women. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but anyway, so th this is like part one of the story. So okay. file that one away. <clears throat> so part two is now I still have, uh, you know, another two hours to kill before this, this uh, birthday party. So... I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go carry through with my plan of um, putting on the shoes, driving across, going to the waterfront. It's sort of the back bay, you know, and there's like marshland and maybe there's a nature trail there. I'd go for a walk, kill some more time. So on the way through, I remember that I need to, I need to get gas and I need to get some fuel injector cleaner and I need to get some motor oil. So this is another errand I can sort of tick off my list. So I, I go to a Napa I go to a Napa Auto Parts store, right? And I go inside, and um, there's a nice black gentleman uh, at the um, at the cashier. And this time, I'm sort of wow, <laughs> you know, this is great. And so I I, I I I ask him a bunch of questions about motor oil, you know, the the 10W30 versus the 10W40, and as the car gets older, do you use a 10W40? And he just starts peeling off all this information. It's like he knew everything. He was like clicking all the boxes. This was like a uh, an incredibly good, satisfying com customer service interaction. And I'm like, wow. And you know, he sort of carried himself like I think he was probably ex-military. Yeah. And, and he, you know, he's a court of so, you know, ex-military guys they sort of comport themselves in a certain way. You know, that you can sort of tell that they were ex-military, right? Yeah. And uh, and like, wow, this is great. I've got some really useful information, respectful, polite, courteous. This is this is a nice, nice experience. Maybe we're not all doomed, right? <laughs> so anyway, I got the I got the uh, motor oil, I get the uh, fuel injector cleaner, I got a bunch of new information to look into, you know. And so that was good. So so then I leave. Um and that killed about 30 minutes total, right? So I'm I'm down to like 90 minutes to kill before this uh, birthday party. So I find this little downtown area near where the birthday party is. And there's like a Juneteenth celebration going on. Right. Remember that new <laughs> holiday that was just created? Yeah. yeah you know? <laughs> I'm so excited, bro. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, uh, imagine my luck, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm looking, I see like, you can see from the distance, there's all these, things set up these um uh what do they call you know those pop-ups i'm blanking the word pop-up displays and then there's music playing and then there's you know so i find a place to park and i start milling through the uh the juneteenth celebration and the music look it's this rap you know it's like it's like a different world i can't understand it i can't i can't even be in the presence of it like i it's so bad it's so hard to listen to and it's uh uh i'm thinking this is so bad it must be a parody right you know like yeah they're not really doing this for enjoyment they're mocking it you know and i was trying sort of seeing if i could uh, 
appreciate it at that level, but it turned out it was sincere. You know? <laughs> people were clapping and but for the wrong reason they think to really enjoy it so anyway i can only bear about 10 minutes of that right and then uh so i i find my way to the waterfront go for a walk you know kill some more time but eventually uh it comes time for the party right i get there and then you know I, we go into this house so these are like san francisco expats that have been forced out of the city and they've moved to the hinterlands and they've bought property rather than uh you know renting and so they have this big i mean from a from a apartment dweller's perspective it's a huge place right multiple rooms living room dining room you know multiple bathrooms upstairs downstairs like you know a real house you know so uh so they're ho holding this party there and i'm sort of in awe of all the real estate because if you, this place in san francisco would be like five million dollars right and you know i was sort of in awe and then slowly but surely all these people start filing in you know these are all urbanites uh uh you know mostly from berkeley you know and uh, uh well dressed and educated and uh, um, uh you know just normies like nice berkeley normies start filing in and there's there's hors d'oeuvres and there's a dining table and uh it's just polite conversation etc you know it's that one of those things this whole sort of urban experience managed to sort of recreate itself in the hinterlands you know and so there's lots of chit chat a lot of idle chit chat about music and uh, wine and oh i'm going to this winery and that winery oh i love pinot noir you know this kind of crap and I'm just kind of nodding along and listening. And, blah, blah, blah. and then I sort of struck up a conversation with this woman who's from Berkeley and she's a typical liberal. And um, But we were sort of talking about the decline of San Francisco, which has now have been really precipitous. And everybody's talking about it because it's, un, it's unmistakable. And I'm, I'm just sort of trying to poke and prod. I'm just sort of trying to get their analysis of what's going on. You know, uh, just yep. trying to see if the different people's different gifts <laughs> thing yep. Yep. had any like purchase yep. in this community. And of course it didn't. But so I, I said, well, what do you think we should do? You know, so basically I had several of these types of conversations with different people throughout the evening. And then I always sort of would end it with, well, what do you think we should do? And universally, the answer was, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, 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 they had no idea. And I think what their idea was to do is what these people had done, which was just get the hell out of the city. So that's my story. Okay. So here's my, my feedback. I would, if I were in a mall with a lot of uh, Somali teen males who uh, addressed in in the same way that I see a lot of people committing crimes dressing, I would get the heck out of there. I would not go to a Juneteenth uh, celebration. Uh, I'd probably like read a book, <laughs> find or you know go for a walk away from the the Juneteenth uh, young Somali or you know any any young men who are dressed like the people I see committing astronomical rates of crime. I would certainly stay the the heck away. But here's my thought. I think this points up the need for vouch nationalism. You should not be able to congregate in a mall as a teenage male unless you've got like 10 adults who are willing to sign off and bear the price for your behavior. What do you think? Vouch nationalism now? I, uh, I agree. My fist is in the air. My fist okay. is in the air. Okay. Vouch nationalism well, okay. now. Well, vouch nationalism tomorrow. Vouch nationalism forever. Yeah. I missed one part of the story. So while in the mall, I, I couldn't help my nose. And my mother noticed this like 30 years ago. And she said, she said in a moment of inspired genius, she said, Americans always seem to have a cup in their hand, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And if you're in the mall, you notice this. Everybody just has this giant soft drink in their hand as if it's a permanent part of their being you know you can't 
to shop and then eat. You need to eat whilst shopping. You can't like you, there's this constant intake of calories going on in America. And it's so apparent in the mall, you know, um, and the obesity, just one after the other, each one fatter than the next, you know, it was so depressing. And I'm sort of muttering to myself, I'm looking about how disgusting this is. And then I caught a glimpse of myself in the mirror and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I got to give, I got to go for a walk, bro. <laughs> so where do you get the power though, to do the things that you need to do? to get to where you want to go get the power yes it's a matter of power bro like it's it takes power to do the things you need to do to get to where you want to go uh, are you talking like spiritually are you talking anything power Hard. like the power uh, to uh, eat right to exercise to do all the things that you need to do to yeah. secure the life that you want it takes power for some people, that's God power. For some people, it's guru power. For other people, it's just internally generated power. Other people, it comes I, from I have friends, to say, it's community. internally generated. Yeah, I, but, I don't. But is that working? Like, are you able to internally generate the power that you need to do the things you need to do to get the life that you want to have? Because I don't. I don't have that internal power. No, I, I, I need I other people. I need community. I need spirituality, I need gurus or inspiration or 12 step or psychology. Like I need a whole cool. bunch of other things outside of myself because what's going on inside of me is not enough for me to get to where I want to go. But what about for you? I'd have to say it's internally generated. In fact, I spent a lot of time thinking, uh, I'm socializing and this is what Luke says I should do. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, I'd just love to be, if I could just be alone. I could just skip this party. I was thinking about ways of skipping the party, like like finding like a nice, gracious way to get out, you know? And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't find one, right? It, meant, it would mean having to tell a whopper of a lie, and I just didn't feel like I should do that. So I actually get a lot of power from solitude. <laughs> so I so we're different. How, how we're bad, different. How painful would things have to get before you came to the conclusion that your internally generated power was not getting the job done. Well, okay. While I was in the mall, when the mall, while I was in the mall and just sort of taking in the spectacles before me at all sides, at all corners of the compass, I'm thinking I actually started having suicidal ideation. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah. who would want to just what's left? I don't want to be in this society. I don't want to be part of this. Like, I don't want to be a millionaire and this is what I get. You know, this is the, this is the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow looking at this just filth. <laughs> now, a lot so, of people who experience suicidal ideation for them, that would be the point at which they realize that something's really wrong with their life and that they need, they need help. Well, but then, well, okay. So, but then as soon as I set foot outside that mall, those feelings just disappeared and I just started chuckling to myself. So was it real suicidal ideation? I don't think so. So how, how would you need to live in with twice as much pain as you have right now before you tried something different? Yeah, I would have to at least double. Because people don't change until the pain of what they're doing now exceeds the expected pain of changing. Uh, hold on a second. People don't do anything now unless the pain that they're currently it, experiencing yeah. exceeds yeah. what they expect the pain to be if they make a change. Right? We do yeah. what is least painful. So if changing right. becomes less painful, we change. Right. If not changing is less painful, we don't change. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, sure. I agree. Um, uh, so you were on a self-improvement kick of, you know, eating right, exercise. About three yeah. weeks ago, you were telling me about this, losing weight. Yeah. How is that? How is that? progress over the past uh, well I, I i keep I, it's been bad because I, I i keep getting knocked off my routine right for one reason or another like even the shoes like my shoes have finally worn it out to the point where you know they're like 
all the padding is gone and it's scraping against my heel and just the pain. So it, it limited the amount of uh, distance I could walk. So I, uh, you know, I got off of that reason. Uh, work, a lot of work demands lately. So that, you know, in the, in the past, I, I would have like, I would get up at six and go out for a walk at six in the morning. But now I just get up at six or seven to start working. So, um, and that, that's unfortunately got me off the routine again. So I do have a problem keeping routines for more than three or four weeks. And then they seem to dissipate. And all it takes is one disruption and then it's sort of back to ground zero. Yeah. So you need the external world to be a certain way for you to be okay. Exactly. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, 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 it, it helps. Things. It helps. Yeah. Now yeah. I make decisions, right? The external yeah. world is definitely an influence. I wouldn't say it's not, but I participate in my own, you know, failing to maintain a routine. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't, there are people who have adversity in external life and still maintain routine. So I can't like necessarily use that as a crutch saying that the world is difficult, but it definitely is an influence. So there's some, some time indifference going on. You're, you're putting off what needs to be done. You're not using your time to support your own vision and to further your own goals. Yeah. 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 And then there's yeah. some perhaps uh, idea deflection. Are you compulsively rejecting ideas that could expand your life or career? And increase your profitability i probably do that but i'm open to, i feel like i'm open to ideas um but the thing is is like you have a pretty established routine right yes and one and a certain portion of it works for you right so for yes. me to come in and say luke well you should change this aspect of your routine and you say no no i've got my own is that really idea deflection or is it just no, I'm going to stick with what works. If you're giving me a good idea and I'm deflecting it, then it's idea deflection. Oh, if I can't hear your idea because it's so threatening to my sense of self, that's you know severe idea deflection. Right, so you may suggest that I buy sheets with a high apply. And if they would, mm. they would significantly enhance the quality of my life, but I'm too insecure to accept that kind of suggestion from you, then I have intense idea deflection going on. You're not still sleeping on plastic, are you? I I like to keep my room warm, so I don't yeah. use any sheets, any blankets. I just usually sleep on the floor with uh, yeah. with a wedge to elevate myself for the sleep apnea and a pillow. And then I wear sweats, and if it's if the temperature drops below seventy degrees, I just put on a very light uh, long sleeve t-shirt. So you don't use a blanket? You just I don't sleep? use a blanket. I don't use sheets. It's just, <laughs> that's it's just me and sweats and the floor. No, that's bizarre. Luke, you're, it, here's what the Chinese say. Cold head, warm feet. You got to keep your feet warm, but you have to keep your head cool. So I think you, I think there you go. You have sleeping problems. You're doing it all wrong, my dude. Thanks, bro. I, I'm trying to be open to this suggestion so I don't... Don't enact idea deflection. Yeah, I know. But seriously, your your head needs to be cold. All that that immense your head, Luke, that brain of yours, you know, is like this atomic reactor that's just generating heat all day long. You gotta let it cool off. And I mean physically cool off. So you have you, one of those cooling piddles? I don't like yeah. uh, I like I like what I got. Yeah. The only thing that I'd add is um a woman. I'm sure there are a lot of women out there who would appreciate, you know, a nice, comfortable floor, a, wedge, oh, yeah. a pillow, yeah, um, nice, warm, shag. comfy temperature so they don't have to be bothered by sheets or blankets or bedding. Yeah. A nice polyester shag carpet. Oh, man. Sounds pretty sweet. Dreams, dreams are made up, man. <laughs> <laughs> man. So did you, did you watch the uh, History Speaks versus Mike Enoch? Debate on the Holocaust. I, I got home. I saw it on Twitter, and uh, I tuned in for a minute. And like, it was about it was about 10 p.m., which is late. It's like almost midnight basketball time for me. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, too, it's, bro. Just, it's like uh, I don't want to think about the Holocaust at 10 p.m. So I just stopped. <laughs> I didn't listen to it. Is it is it worth watching? 
I, I, I haven't listened to it, so. Uh, uh, but I can't believe you didn't want to learn about the Holocaust at 10 p.m. <laughs> yeah, it feels like, I don't know, this past six years has been just Holocaust all day long. Uh, <clears throat> no, sure but I, I, I'm sure that's I am... Bad. I am impressed with um, Enoch's competitor there. I forgot his name. The guy on your show, Matt. History Speaks. Yeah, Matt. Yeah. Uh, he's definitely a very, um, he's definitely very a confident fellow. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, I, I, am, I watched like the first five minutes. And I was just impressed with uh, how he conducted himself. So, so uh, I even. So I asked Stephen James, like, what is excessive masturbation? And he said, next question. So <laughs> Stephen James was afraid to go there. He seemed distinctly uncomfortable with talking about his masturbation life on the show. Uh, but you are someone who is at ease with who you are. You're at ease with reality. You're at ease with other people. Like, oh, where yeah. is the fine line between excessive masturbation and the correct amount of masturbation? Um, as long as you're not on uh, a meetup call at work. A Zoom call. Yeah, once you're, uh, if you're on a Zoom call and you just can't wait, you have a problem. What if you're rubbing the skin off your penis so that it's bleeding? Is that, is that bad? Asking for a friend. <laughs> I think you need to stop before blood for bleeding. Yeah, that's okay, also so it's another it's another warning line. against wanking to bleeding. You know, I'm old school, Luke. I yeah. I'm not part of this generation, so I I uh, you know I'm around. I remember manual stick shifts, Luke. I remember um, cassette tapes. You know, there's just certain lines you just didn't cross. Hmm. Hmm. Powerful. <laughs> powerful, powerful, powerful. I know. Uh, uh, so how long were we talking to Stephen? I literally tuned in. I saw that you started to stream at 7 a.m. Pacific, which is... Well, when I stop streaming, I've got to do a deep carpet cleaning. Like, mm. move a lot of stuff out and move, you know, stuff back in. Like, vacuum the carpet and then use the, the carpet cleaner thing that I bought. So we're talking, like, minimum of two hours of, of work, fair dinkum work once I stop streaming. So I'm thinking about streaming for like seven hours. <laughs> You're really, really dreading this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought yeah. by now I'd have a Sheila who'd do this for me. Yeah, but she's like, no, I need a Serta. I need a Serta, no, Serta or no deal. Would you I... do that? Would you buy a bed? Would you buy a proper bed if that? If that's no, what no, yeah. no, it's so bourgeois. I am. I am someone who's constantly breaking boundaries, bro. I, I don't want to be shackled with these bourgeois conceptions of betting. Yeah. You know, the, who is it that said the uh, hatred of the middle class is the beginning of all virtue? <laughs> Do you? Who, I don't know who said that. I think it was one of these leftist Marxist types, uh, which is not a quote I agree with, but... I think it's uh, amusing nonetheless. Uh, I got a friend who's an Orthodox Jew who says that I don't want to buy a bed because I'd feel too guilty taking a woman to bed. And so I solve my conscience by only taking her to floor. <laughs> so you have, you have, you have withheld from us this little tidbit of your life. The fact that you sleep on the floor uh, for all these years, Luke, you don't feel a little guilty. No, I mean, how come I didn't a, know that? This is today? a performance, Elliot. This is not the real Luke Ford. This is a you know, you know people don't get to know me by by doing a show. This is a performance, like the the real stuff that goes on in my life. I keep private and sacred, you know, with few exceptions. Okay, so finally, the floor sleeping. You decided. Yeah, finally, you I'm gonna I'm gonna sell that enough. part of my soul for yeah. the show, You're but I, gonna... I don't just sell all of my soul willy nilly. Just like, you know, every um, live stream, just sell my whole soul and try to monetize it. Like, no, I, I keep most of it back. I protect it. Okay. Because some of us would think that you just let it all hang out, as it were. Ah, that's a performance, bro. Uh, uh, now I see. Now I see. 
Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, Luke, uh, it's been fun, but I, I, I got to do my next journey, my step on my journey. Okay. Blessings. It was, it was real though. It's been real. Okay. All okay. Right, so blessings. Australia, England, day, end of day three of their first te test match at Edgebaston. I think we can all remember where we were in 2005, where England just barely hung on to win by two runs in one of the top five most thrilling test matches of all time. England won that Ashes series. But I identify with, with cricket bowlers, you know, who catch the batter just, you know, leg before wicket, and then they turn to the ump and they just go, how's that? How's that? How's that? that, that that's, that's what I feel like when I, I do a live stream. How's that? But it's just like, yeah, I, I arguing on the internet and, and being like sarcastic and stuff are kind of, if it turned off a whole lot of people and I felt I was being too cruel, I, I wouldn't do it. But I, I don't think that I'm, I'm too cruel. But I do listen to feedback. So you know, but the, but that's, that's the same, that's the same thing you critiqued the change that you perceive in Twitter with Elon Musk. You, you, the critique you had is that since Elon Musk took over, Twitter is more reactive, less productive, and, and you're basically doing the same thing. That's what I hear you saying. No, and and so you're basically saying you like doing it. So I'm saying, yo, yo, yo. But it, I, what I'm saying is like in, in the case for me and the way that, you know, online things, I, the, there's the concept of like debate pros and stuff, right? And, and people that, that have been involved in internet debates on forums and stuff. That's kind of my, my personality. Now, if you are the owner of a social media company and you tweak the algorithm to promote like a, you know, partisan polemical content and outreach for it, that's a completely different thing. And it, it is also like a whole bunch of social media companies have already done that. And we kind of know where it goes. So I, I don't begrudge people to use social media in the way that they want. You just have to deal, you know, you have to deal with the consequences of whatever you, way you choose to interact. But the algorithm changes that I think Elon has brought has, uh, you know, it, dep it depends how you in interact with Twitter. But there's a lot of videos of people being hit by trains or buses, people fighting in CCTV <laughs> footage and uh, like on the For You tab. And that before was like, um, you know, pre prevented from like kind of trending in general uh, tabs. But I think Elon prioritizes that that will get reactions. And, people and it's the same reason you put it on and act that way on Twitter. Yeah, that's but... basically what you just told me. No, no. So I think it's a bit different because like what I'm trying to say is like, I, I don't, I think that being harshly critical can provoke you know, can provoke responses in people. I know that. Uh, right. And that's exactly what reactivity in Twitter is designed to do, provoke responses, because the goal yeah, of but, social so media is engagement. But that's the difference, because the goal, so if I wanted that, then my, your, uh, your interpretation would be, my goal is to get a uh, Pajot and to get him to react and to get him to feud. No, no, and, that's not your goal. No, you're clear yeah. about that. That's not your goal. Yeah, my goal is to criticize the specific, like, uh, thing which I see right. as, the, like, critical, but not, not in the sense of like, because I want to drive engagement and, and create a feud, right? No, like I know, you're, but, but see, I hear two things. One of the things is I would say, and we don't have enough time to get into this, but you're essentially trying to fight a religious war or a spiritual war, because it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a culture war that you're engaging in. And you know, you've got ideas of sides and that's absolutely normal. We sort of binary the world, good, bad, and from there. That, 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 I wouldn't and, say binary because like the, the, the model is that, the, I, I, the thing that I don't have is that everyone's perspective is, equally valid like it's equally fine to say russia is being right. no no you know, no right you have a moral universe that you're engaging in and you're right. trying to push the moral universe more towards the good and resist the evil that's what you're doing i get that i don't deny but, that but the, i guess the bit that the, i'm trying to just check that if you deny is like there is a reality right like that in, in events like realist. russia and, and that, that kind of thing so there are people that think that ukraine is the aggressor and that there it's a denazification pro uh, okay yeah yeah so i i'm a moral realist now whether okay. i'm in touch with all the moral reality that's another question whether i'm right, right. on it that's another question but i'm a moral realist and so okay. what i hear so you saying is the, yeah you... so a moral realist is someone who believes that there is a morality that exists outside of the individual's head and so thinking about this i realized that i am a moral realist who conducts his show as though I am, most of the time, as though I'm not a moral realist. So I conduct the show as, you know, different people have different gifts, different understandings of, of what's right and wrong. And the only way you can get to some kind of transcendent, you know, supposedly uh, objective standard of morality is if you make a leap of faith. And I don't argue about faith on the show. So I live my life in part by faith. You know, I believe in God. I believe in Orthodox Judaism. I believe that God's the, the force behind the Torah. So I live my life as a moral realist, but I conduct the show as though I'm not a moral realist. So maybe I'm deluding myself somewhere, but that's how I understand things. I On one hand, what you're trying to do is push, you know, push towards the 
the correct towards the good by um by being and, and you're an argumentative person so you're taking your yes. argumentative nature and your moral orientation and you're going to twitter and you are doing that yeah 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 that's yeah, that's I get a, it. yeah, I get yeah. It. And that... your your critique of twitter since musk i personally haven't noticed much of any difference but we all experience it depending because it's a social media platform i'm not going to argue that one it way depends on each of the but feeds yeah it's sort of like there's this area of town that's really nice and it's very quiet and the streets seem to be okay. That would say, let's say, a Twitter under an ideal situation. And then there's Twitter where, you know, sort of the, the regime, the, the mayor is, is just kind of liking to provoke um, excitement and drama by pitting people together. So that'd be bad Twitter and good Twitter. And in either Twitter, you go out and start knife fights. So I don't right, know how right. it's a moral value to start a knife fight in a good neighborhood and then blame the bad mayor for having a knife fight environment. So that would be in the case of like, you, what you, you know, a point I think that would like would make it clear is that you and I, would agree that like the targeting of the the dead parent the children uh, the parents of dead children is something that can be criticized harshly in a knife fight way and it isn't the same as somebody else going out in a knife fight way to advocate that we should target the parents I of children i would argue that if i want so talking about alex jones chris kavanaugh says alex jones is beyond the pale for encouraging the targeting of the sandy hook parents right after that mass shooting in sandy hook alex jones said it was the psyop and he essentially encouraged his followers to make life miserable for the poor parents who had their children murdered at the Sandy Hook Elementary School. I want to get someone to stop doing something bad. Well, I'm, I'm not a pacifist, so I do believe in police and military, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of personal engagement, generally speaking, mm. um, if I want to actually get in touch with the person, I would rather have some moral transformation than Which just- Which person? Uh, it depends on the person. And, and you know, I'm not about to try to build a relationship with Alex Jones. It's not going to happen. Right. And so the, the my target is not Pajot, if I, uh, I'm not trying to trans necessarily trans You're attacking the spirit of numerology that's right. out there in the culture. <laughs> the, the practice, I would say, but yes, the, the spirit, if you prefer. But but yes, the the, the like a, a potentially, generally not that harmful thing, but overall, I think something which like it isn't a great heuristic to follow. So yeah, but I, 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 I take, I do take the point, Paul, that the, uh, like, there is an approach which is, you know, more in line with the, the kind of thing that you're emphasizing and, and which I think Andrea responds to. And and I think there's there's good psychology research about, you know, on an individual level that you you will convince more people by being a lot more empathetic and, you know, like considerate to their their worldview. Um like if 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 that's what you want to achieve, that might be the more effective way to do it right like for everyone to be more like a social worker than like you know it's, it's getting a harsh critique is never enjoyable right um but i i would say that there is enough variation in the world and in my inbox that the kind of way that i critique people is not entirely ineffective at reaching people and maybe is part of the, the you know the kind of tapestry <laughs> that it exists for critical content but i but i okay i think a good discussion there between chris Kavanaugh who is secular, who's an atheist and, and a materialist and a Christian pastor. Just a little bit more from Robert Wright here talking with Mickey Kaus from Friday Night. I didn't Night. know how to break this to you, Mickey, but I have lost that love and feeling. We can talk about that. Um, the, um, uh, I, I, there is a, a lot of fervor on the Democratic side for this thing called the Popular Vote Compact. Mm -hmm. Basically says, you know, we're sick of losing the, uh, losing the electoral vote after we win the popular vote. Although one time John Kerry almost won the electoral vote after losing the popular vote. So it can work both ways. Usually it works for against the Democrats. So they want to substitute the popular vote. Understandable. There are all sorts of arguments why you should have a popular vote, why you should have an electoral vote. Probably the popular vote is you know, more democratic, but it's not in the Constitution. So they say, well, we'll have states pledge to cast their electors for the winner of the popular vote. And as soon as we get 270 or however many electoral votes you need worth of states, it will go into effect. And then we will, in, in effect, have a popular vote election because, uh, you know, uh, you know, because the popular vote winner will win the electoral college too. And it's a way, it's an attempt to jury rig the system on top of the constitution to give it something the constitution doesn't have. The problem is we've had our, we've had it drummed into our heads for, since the uh, Trump election that we, you know, states have to have to cast their electoral votes for the winner of their primaries. They can't countermand the state electors. They can't send a separate state slate that they like. And this totally violates that principle. It also sort of violates, uh, I think it probably violates the revision to the electoral count act. Maybe not, uh, but uh, it, it, it just, it, it's, it's too clever by half, and it, it, it sort of, you know, the state electors could say, well, if the liberals want us to cast a vote, ignore the state's voters and cast votes for this person who won the popular vote, you know, why can't we ignore the electors and cast a vote for whoever the Federalist Society wants to be president? I mean, if, you know, if we have an independent power to do that, let's 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 do it our way. It's just that it, in the left seems completely oblivious to this pattern. I don't know I mean, if it's exact. I think that's an excellent uh, critique there by Mickey Kaus. Right. Uh, History Speaks, Matt Cockerell debated Mike Enoch Friday night on Holocaust denial. And uh, Matt, 
a PhD student in history at London School of Economics. He was impaled on the horns of a dilemma because he really wanted to have this debate with Mike Enoch. On the other hand, Mike Enoch sensed how badly Matt wanted this debate. So Mike Enoch started pushing back with all sorts of demands that Matt found outrageous. So here's a conversation between uh, Matt Cockrell and uh, Veronica. And frankly, behavior which I often encountered many of the other three people I've debated on Holocaust now, Jim Rizzoli, Thomas Dalton, Marshall Lore. Uh, none of them were bitches about um, uh, format. None of them were filibustering. All were pretty easy to arrange a format with. Didn't try to get out of other obligations. Didn't lie constantly. And so Mike really is actually giving other deniers a, a bad name, <laughs> funny as that is to say. <laughs> so yeah, let me just talk about how we got here. And then Veronica, I'm going to have you pull up a couple of the things I emailed you uh, just as evidence for some of the stuff I'm talking about. Okay, so way back in 2020, way, way, way back, you know, we're all different people back then, right? Especially Veronica, but no, <laughs> we're all different people back then. It's a different world. Trump is still president and so on. Uh, we agreed, all four, four people agreed. Uh, I agreed. And so here's some context. I did a lot of shows with Mike Enoch and Eric Stryker, and I think they all were quite cordial. Uh, there was no yelling. So Friday night, you know, Matt and Mike were just degenerating into to yelling at each other. And I think haven't seen the Friday night show of Matt versus Mike Enoch, but I think just from my own interactions with Matt, that I, I suspect that he played a role in this. So I respect Matt. I like Matt and he sometimes triggers me because I find him often, you know, rude and condescending because he, he'll just frequently interject, you know, moral judgments into conversations that, where I don't believe the conversations are enhanced by his moral judgments. He might say, oh, you know, I heard an old stream where, you know, you describe so something as, as degenerate and, you know, I, I want you to know that I don't hold that against you. All right. Uh, so there's nothing like pronouncing moral judgments to really inhibit and infuriate someone that you're having a conversation with. Also, if you're frequently interrupting someone, that also tends to in infuriate people. So those are just some, some thoughts on what may have played a role in the degeneration of the Matt Cockrell, Mike Enoch debate Friday night. And Avi Biderman agreed to debate Mike Enoch and Eric Stryker in Holocaust denial. And then in 2021, we sent our, the, the agreement was we're going to both send our information. And um, we did that. So we sent our information in uh, 2021. And then at that point, Mike and Stryker quit the debate because they were really upset over a moderator or host that was Jewish, supposedly, or radically political. Um, and I agreed to change the debate, change the moderator. I was like, I thought it was dumb because I didn't think the moderator was going to do anything. But I'm like, okay, whatever, if that's the big hang up. And Avi did not agree. Um, so it ended up that uh, our 2v2 changed into a 1v1, Mike Enoch and I. And I just said, okay, Mike, I've sent the information. This is back in September 2021. Send me your stuff whenever you can, right? Um, and since then, we've had uh, a year and a half of dodging, combined, more than a year and a half of dodging, combined with excuses and lies constantly to his audience. I've debated since 20, September 2021. Uh, three people in Holocaust denial, unless Marshall Lore was before that, at least two and, and maybe three. I don't remember exactly when Marshall Lore debate was. And uh, the bike has continued to delay, delay, delay. And um, let's pull up the first article I sent you now, Veronica, if you will. Share the screen and pull up number one, the substack. Okay, here it is. Yeah. Okay, I'll just uh, leave it there. Lawrence Connor says I should uh, stop streaming, get to cleaning my floor. Lawrence, I mean, you, you can't stand me, man, but you know what keeps bringing you back? to uh, this show. Just, uh, just a tad curious why you keep coming back. Terrific uh, podcast, Embrace the, the Void by left-wing academic, philosopher, and what, what was the about section here? Embrace the, the Void, contact, uh, uh, forget, forgetting the name of the host, but anyway, let me play a little bit from latest episode released June 9th, The Language of Terrorism with Chris Cavanaugh. And, and like right. even me, right? You know, I'm a know. very minor person, but I've been, the only people who have offered me money to do stuff are like uh, weird, <laughs> right? wing leaning stuff. So yeah, that's, right. I, I think there's Tied a- weird uh, academic activities. Yeah, just, just like stuff which I actually wouldn't mind doing, except then I'm kind of like, well, but I don't want to accept money uh, to do that. And I, yeah, it just listed alongside certain other individuals. Exactly. Um, yes, correct. Yeah. Um, right. You're afraid of guilt by association because you're a coward. I understand. Uh, let's look at <laughs> yeah. your papers. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, no, one other I thing, Aaron. One other yeah. thing. This possibly might not be right, but sub, like kind of supplement chilling. I guess this relates to that mm -hmm. whole. All right. Hosted by Aaron Rabinowitz. 
left wing philosopher thing. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I you know I would class Huberman mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Lex Friedman a little bit in a, a slight. So talking about Andrew Huberman of Stanford University. The separate sphere, um, and, but sure. th there just seems a, a slight more tolerance towards chilling things. But I don't know. I, that could be just I'm I'm not exposed enough to left wing content to see what they're chilling. Um, I bet they're shilling naturalism stuff that is basically the same thing, just probably packaged differently and, you know, like slightly different uh, vibes. Um, yeah. They're I, definitely you know, shilling like... parasociality. Yeah. Like, the, the, sure, you know, sure. all of, I mean, ha with Hassan Avi and a whole bunch of people, the, the kind of point is often made that they are millionaires living in mansions while uh, like decrying capitalist systems, which, you know, I'm not saying I'm, I am aware of the little, guy popping out of the well um saying you know <laughs> the uh, right. curious but but i but i do think there is something that guy right yeah i do think there's something of a potential contradiction there sure. when you're earning you know eighty thousand or something from your podcast per month um yeah i i, I that's <laughs> capitalistically you're very successful right right um Okay, I have more thoughts there, but maybe we'll save them for bonus stuff. I want to talk some about your papers before we run out of time. And I, if I say your papers, you are the second author, which I assume just means you did the editing. Um, uh, it's relatively accurate, yeah. Pretty so much accurate, the... right? Taking credit for, uh, it looks like a woman's work, I think, in this case. Julia Ebner, who I should probably get on to actually explain these things at some point. You should. She's very yeah. good. Uh, uh -huh. She's a researcher of extremism uh, for quite a long uh, time. Um, but, but actually, in interesting trajectory because started out as you know, working in NGOs and and kind of research mm -hmm. think tanky kind of stuff, but now has just uh, completed or is in the process of completing her PhD, and she is my, mm. uh, I'm one of her supervisors, so it's oh work. I see, so you're just getting credit for her work because you're her supervisor. I, I understand. That's um, it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I so, just provide the annoying feedback constantly. <laughs> yeah. So you shared these with me, and they are definitely in my wheelhouse. The titles of the two papers that you shared were uh, The QAnon Security Threat, A Linguistic Fusion-Based Violence Risk Assessment, and Is There a Language of Terrorists a Comparative Manifesto Analysis? Um, I tried to parse these, but they're really dense with like woke verbiage about like- Woke verbiage. <laughs> yeah, you've got all this stuff about high prevalence of linguistic identity fusion, which obviously is just critical theory nonsense. Um, no, no, so no, I was wondering no. if you try to parse for me like what's going on with this There's no fusion language concept here. Don't be smart me, Aaron. And there's no critical theory. <laughs> <I'm just> in... <laughs> Julia, <technically. laughs> yeah. Well, well. So the one one thing I can speak to is like Julia is applying a model, a theoretical model um, about uh, radicalization and extremism, which I've worked on quite a lot in my ritual work, and which my uh, my kind of boss, mm. my PhD supervisor Harvey Whitehouse is the is the person who developed it, and so she's applying that model, which we've been working on for quite a while, to uh, this material. So the yeah, been that model then for starters, yeah. Yeah. So I identity fusion is, you know, psychologists like to study group bonding and these kind of things, and they like to come up with terms uh, and, and develop mm -hmm. skills, right? Mm -hmm. Self-report mm -hmm. or other types of skills where they measure concepts and then they apply it to the specific um, psychological term that they've come up with. And, and then other psychologists use it and they reap uh, citations, right? And they carve up the messy qualitative world into like quantitative artificial categories. But so identity fusion is one of those. Um, and it's, it's contra uh, it contrapositioned to social identity theory, group identification. Um, okay. I, I, there's a various reasons that people have proposed why these are different types of like bonding and why it's significant. But the, the kind of key aspects that I think are worth um, considering and apply, even if you don't really buy the actual, you know, distinctions between these two broad categories of group bonding are that uh, identity fusion is supposed to be where there's strong relational ties towards a group. Uh, so instead of like a depersonalized categorical type membership where you, you don't feel attached to, you know, it's more the group that you're attached to, like a, a religious group, right? Like if you imagine you uh -huh. don't know all the Christians. as a Catholic or something. Right, yeah, like that kind of thing. Or it worked for a company, <laughs> right? Um, but the way that example came to mind when I was chatting with you. <laughs> yeah, oh, and, and and also an important aspect is in the traditional social identity uh, theory model, there's this thing called functional antagonism, which is basically humans are made up of all different uh, like social and, and personal identities, right? And broadly sure. speaking, when a social identity is activated, your personal identity goes down. So mm -hmm. in if you are, for example, uh, Aaron, with your friends and family talking, you're Aaron, right? And your idiosyncratic habits are of interest and whatnot. If you're Aaron in Japan, you're an exemplar of an American and you will be mm -hmm. kind of presented in that way. I think this is a, a sophisticated and important point. In, in other words, as I understand it, the, the weaker your personal identity, all right, the more labile your, your identity, the more 
you are incentivized to get rid of an unwanted self and to dissolve yourself in a group. This is developed in much more depth by Eric Hoffer in his classic work, The True, True Believer. So if you're a true believer, you want to get rid of your unwanted self, dissolve yourself into a group, and then you are much more liable to do all sorts of you know, nasty or self-sacrificial or extreme things that you would not do when you're just an individual. That you know, you're speaking for Americans or whatever, and you might become more stereotyped. Or if you're at a football match and you are, you know, the the other people are supporting the rival team, that's the identity which is more salient in that context. So all these are saying that like there's a kind of hydraulic relation. Right. So uh, our identities vary depending on context. All right. At at work, I may primarily have one identity. When I'm hanging out with a certain group of friends, I may primarily identify as a writer. When I hang out with other friends, my primary identity will be that of an Orthodox Jew. In another context, my primary identity will be that of an Alexander Technique teacher. So the situation often determines which of our identities is preeminent. And, uh, and that implication of it, it would be including for things like group violence, right? That right. personal identity can uh, dissolve to some extent in highly social identity salient contexts, so, and yeah. you could be more violent. Yeah, at least if I can understand, just so, so as I understand what you're describing, these aren't like, it's either this or that theories. It's like, these are two different models for how sometimes there is a relationship between identity and individuals. Is that right? It, so, yes. So uh, I kind of mix things in there. But what I just described, that functional antagonism principle is right. classical social identity theory, right? And, right. and that's right. the kind of and categorical... So, yeah, so, so just like broadly speaking, though, psychologically, what it seems like you're describing are one kind of person to group identity where it's not about interpersonal connections with other individuals so much as a subsuming of personal identity into a group identity. You're Nazis, you're, you know, you're, you're yeah. Catholics in the broad sense versus, you know, like if you have your Irish Catholics who like are, are Catholic because they are closely connected to a family or community or something. And, and it, the, the identity goes via those interpersonal relations. That's the thing that y'all are focused on. Is that right? So identity fusion where it dis right. is distinctive from this is essentially saying that there are plenty of group contexts and, and like strong group bonds were personal and group identity are kind of synergistically activated and self-reinforcing mm -hmm. such that right you are interpersonally connected to individuals in the group or potentially the group in a relational way, you know, like personifying the group, but like, uh, but that interpersonal relational style bonds are important and your personal identity remains salient as well as mm -hmm. the group identity. And, and the important distinction here would be like, if you're uh, like, if your group is attacked, it is like your personal identity being attacked and vice versa. If you're attacked, you can uh, like transpose that onto the group is being attacked. So that doesn't happen in the classic social model. In social identity okay. theory, it is more, more described as like, if you're no, highly identified, your personal identity goes down, right? So like if the if mm -hmm. the group is being attacked, that's not necessarily directly uh, like an attack on your personal identity, unless you're like subsumed. I guess it being more like a one directional, like, you know, if someone attacks the Nazi party, then they're attacking every individual, but we don't care about the individual's identity yeah, being attacked. It yeah. is it is like that. It's just this like, mm -hmm. there's just this weird quirk about like personal activation. It's kind of like psychologists, you know, I doing studies where they try to make so social or personal identity salient and then say, if you threaten a group identity, does it cause a stronger reaction if you have this kind of body right. or whatever? And the way they're measured is like using, you know, verbal scales or in particular fusion is often associated with this variation of the inclusion of self in other scale, which is like these right. two circles. And you, you know, say, which one represents your relationship with the group to them overlapping and being like subsumed. Um, yeah, and I want to get into the methods in these studies a little bit because I'm curious about how that works and what you think like we can really derive from this. Um, but let's just say broadly speaking, just to help people feel grounded in sort of practically what you're describing, because like I want to make sure that people are getting a sense of what this looks like for human psychology on the ground. What does it look like in terms of, you know, behavioral things that you're checking for here? What are you, what are you concerned might be the case if it's true that, you know, there's a bunch of this um, linguistic identity fusion running around in QAnon? Yes, yeah, so this is the issue. So the um, the the model uh, proposed by Harvey Whitehouse, the anthropologist at Oxford, is that when you have this uh, strong relational type of bonding, you know, identity fusion, or just you know some form of relational bonding with a group, and you have a perceived external threat, um, uh, and ideally when you have a group which endorses violent action, right? Uh, this is important as well. Like what group values mm -hmm. are activated, then you have like a potent. Uh, tinderbox for extreme pro-group action. Now, if your group has group values, which are like the extreme pro-group action, they sacrifice your life to do humanitarian work, right? Like white helmet kind of stuff sure. in, in Syria. This can be very good, right? Like because you are willing to lay down your life for a cause and to, you know, help help people out uh, if, when there's like a crisis situation. Um, however, if there are uh, like endorsements of, of violent action, this kind of bonding is uh, proposed to be particularly likely to lead to people uh, performing violent actions, not just endorsing them, but actually conducting them. Whereas is that compared to the classic model. 
yeah, and the argument is that the, the classic model, it's not that it can never lead to violence. There's plenty of occasions where people are like highly ideologically committed to a group and, and you know, are willing to perform actions or um, like uh, de-individuated in, in a group scenario and, and perform violence. But it's more that that can also occur where people will ideologically endorse violence, but not be willing to do it, right? And, and the mm -hmm. argument is that identity fusion is the better driver or this kind of relational group bonding is a better group driver and predictor of like actual uh, violent action. Yeah, I have two questions. One is I'd be curious if you could give any like clear cut case examples where you're like, this is very strongly driven by this kind of identity fusion, this particular violent action. And I also what came to mind is, is there a connection to the particular kind of playbook of like in-person cult, you know, like identity fusion? Do, do you yeah. see like high identity fusion in those, in like, and that drives, you know, behavior within those communities more strongly? Yeah, so like, it's not just the particular model proposed by like Harvey Whitehouse that, that makes this argument. Like if you take Scott Adrian, the anthropologist, he also emphasizes, right, that what um, the kind of potent combination is a, a devotion to secret values, which you could see as the ideological component, right? Secret values that being mm -hmm. values that you won't trade for any amount of money and, and you kind of regard as, you know, beyond negotiation, that Palestine is mm -hmm. uh, the land of the Palestinians, for example, right? Um, then, but the other side of that, he talks about this this kind of, Relation, intensely relational connection with other people and, and a kind of, you know, band of brothers or that kind of thing. And so when you look at people say the 9-11 terrorists, right, there, there is the aspect where they're committed to the jihad, right, and to attack. So Jonathan Haidt would talk about this being ties bind and blind. Once you get tied to a particular community or to sacred values, right, you will both feel a strong sense of connection, but you'll also become blind. To certain things Attack america for its perceived crimes um and mm -hmm. uh, they're in on al-qaeda ideology however they're also arranged in cells where they are small closely knit group of people with strong relational ties who you know self-reinforce and this model you see very often even when you have a bigger organization where you might have like a terrorist uh you know a, yeah. a, an international terrorist organization often organized into these smaller cells for the the groups that are going to perform attacks or that kind uh -huh. of thing so uh -huh. okay. it, it, there's not, it's not that there's no exception to this. You do get right. people who do things on their own or, you know, um, are kind of forced into it because of circumstances. Like, for example, an alternative would be, or I don't know if this is actually an, an alternative, maybe in a way um, supports this, but like the kamikaze pilots in Japan are often presented as like these, uh, you know, brainwashed fanatics who were willing, mm -hmm. happy to die for the emperor. But we know from their diaries and from records about the training that they um, enjoyed and letters that they sent that, you know, there was no option really. Like the the way it was presented was this is the correct thing to do. And yes, they were indoctrinated, you know, for, for the education system, but also they felt a very strong obligation to their family. And if they don't do it, someone else sure. in their you know regiment or whatever is going to take part in it. So it, it, that creates that like, is that the, the, because people really, you know, want to sacrifice their life or is that more, you know, the kind of uh, like a, an, a structural system that forces people to sacrifice their life? But still in there mm. is this important thing about, you know, relational ties, be it to family. Yeah. So much of what we think of as being individual, oh, you know, I'm this way or I'm that way or I think this, I do this because I believe it's right. So much of what we think is coming from an individual is really something that we've learned and that we pick up from the community around us from from our family and friends and extended community or to like fellow soldiers so i think models that downplay that aspect are often missing an important component and in in the case with these there's there's actually three papers there's one more um with with julia that is looking at uh so we, we kind of, one of the papers is looking at mm. these 15 manifestos um Oh, sorry, well, yeah, you did send the third one, I apologize. Um, you know, the, the third one, one, the third one, there's two of them that go together, so. Oh my God, we don't have an academic paper here that is looking at various manifestos, including Mein Kampf. They know that if people just delve even a little bit into Mein Kampf, they can completely lose their minds. They can get fired from prestigious positions in life. They can give up, you know, some six-figure job and end up, you know, driving for Uber. Very dangerous stuff. Two of them are focused on these manifestos. And we basically did like a content analysis of the manifestos, looking at these uh, like kind of linguistic categories or linguistic markers for a whole bunch of different things, including identity fusion, including uh, social identification with the group, but but also, you know, dehumanizing language, uh, conspiracy <laughs> beliefs, so on. Yeah, and and so I want to get into your methods some. Um, cause I think it's, it's helpful to be able to understand kind of how the sausage gets made a little bit. Um, otherwise, it just sounds like hand waving and making claims. Um, but I want to bait this. So talking about dehumanizing language, is there any, you know, substantial number of people who doesn't, who don't frequently use dehumanizing language? 
I mean, the most liberal, the most left-wing, the most pro-diversity people will still refer to vast swaths of humanity as absolute rubbish. Right? The, the complex and diverse nature of humanity is too much for almost all of us, and so we may have an in-group based on our family, on our race, on our ethnicity, on our religion, on our belief system, on our geography, on our profession. It's almost a human imperative to find all sorts of ways of just dismissing the humanity of vast swaths of the, of the world so that we can you know, be better situated to deal with the complicated nature of reality. We just don't want to engage with so many outgroups, and this seems to be just as prevalent on the left as the right. Took a little bit more because I think it seems to me intuitively, you know, check my logic on this, but if what y'all are saying is accurate, right? We have this question in America in particular right now, but generally about stochastic terrorism that, hmm. you know, your Alex Joneses of the world say certain things and those there's a, there's a decent chance that those. So stochastic means random, infrequent. Behaviors turn into, you know, those claims turn into behaviors by certain listeners, right? Um, what it seems like you're saying is if you look at two communities and one of them has this much higher rate of linguistic identity fusion, representing a kind of relational connections within the, you know, the, the, um, the smaller communities, that those individuals, if their ideology is attached, like you said, to a broader, you know, Alex Jones kind of narrative, they're going to be at higher risk, it seems like, of actually taking terrorist actions, for example. Is that the concern? Yeah. So I, I think the, the kind in, in Harvey's model, the, the kind of, Three factors that are emphasized is the presence of identity fusion, existential threat, uh, like a perceived existential threat, and a group condoning like violent actions, right? So there, there is the ideological um, component. So I know how ruthless I get when I'm running late to an important uh, appointment. Uh, so I know how ruthless I will get if my you know, in-group is under attack, under threat. So I think this is just pretty much pervasive. People become much more... You know, in-group identifying, much more racist, you know, much more suspicious of outsiders, the, the more stress they feel, the more of a threat that they feel. Of it. But so if... So if the 2024 election in the United States, for example, is conducted under an atmosphere of, you know, great internal or external threat of, you know, decreasing sense of, of safety in the public square then that would play to Republicans' advantage because conservatives tend to poll much higher with regard to uh, tough foreign policy and tough attitudes towards law enforcement and punishing criminals. On the other hand, if we're relatively prosperous and feeling safe in 2024, that will appeal to Democrats who will provide you know, social welfare spending and have much more soothing things to say about outgroups. So the more right wing you are, the more likely you are to have negative feelings and suspicions about outgroups. The more liberal and left you are, the more open you're likely to be to outgroups. If you have those three things together, that that, that is a, a potentially more dangerous set of catalysts than uh, other factors, which are also important, like things like martyrdom narratives or justification of violence or, uh, sorry, or uh, dehumanization, like these kind of things. So there's, there's a whole bunch of, you know, there's a mm -hmm. lot of work on what kind of things drive people. So I think the more stress you're under, the more of a threat you feel, the more likely you are to use dehumanizing language and thinking. To engage in violent actions or to even or endorse violent actions, which are different, right? That's because there's a lot more people that endorse violent actions than actually engage in them. Um, sure. And the, the, it's not like you. Oh, I forgot to talk to Eli Elliot Blatt about this, but he's often looking for oral candy. So can a moderate podcast ever be as compelling as entertaining? Can it grab you and move you nearly as much as a more extreme podcast, right? People with moderate views in, in politics, religion, all right, they frequently get, you know, more of a charge, more of a sense of excitement, more sense of fulfillment from listening to perspectives that are far more extreme than their own. And most people, for example, don't endorse terrorism, but uh, many people have uh, sympathy you know, for, for terrorists if the terrorism is being conducted on behalf of their in-group. Want people to be endorsing violence and to, you know, dehumanizing the right group. But but if you can only, <laughs> yeah. if the goal is to stop, you know, violence from happening, you want to know what is the the most likely people to engage in violence, and and that's yeah. kind of um, mm -hmm. what what we're interested in looking at like is it possible to identify um like higher right. risk so there's a couple of tempting threads to pull on there but i do want to hear a little bit about methods first and then i'm going to like try to cause you to say inappropriate things um yeah. 
what, how does this work? You, you know, I, like in your, in your method descriptions, right, we get a bit of like coding of these things. I'm not sure that like, I think coding is probably a term people might understand intuitively, but like, do you want to give some sense of how, how your approach works and what level of confidence you come away with that this is tracking something out there in reality? Yeah. So, so like I said, in, in two of the papers and they're really connected, there's a, uh, 15 manifestos that are examined and this includes like 12, which are ideologically extreme, um, and things like Dylan Roof's manifesto, Brenton Tarrant, the Christchurch Shooters manifesto, uh, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, <laughs> right? The classics, mm, the classics. Sure. Um, and, My God, how, how dangerous is that? They're analyzing Mein Kampf. Even to to look at that that document is to you know risk losing your soul. Elliot Blatt says, I don't necessarily seek out extreme content, but these days the more radical analysis seems to better describe reality. But my question was. Is it as easy for a moderate podcast to be compelling compared to a more extreme podcast? Is it as easy for a moderate podcast to provide an emotional charge as a more extreme podcast? So it would seem to me it is 10 times more difficult for a moderate podcast to provide that emotional charge and that compelling sense that uh, often comes with the more extreme content. And we have three moderate comparison uh, manifestos or speeches, right? Simon, Simon de Bouvier, The Second Sex, Martin Luther Simone. King, I Have a Dream Speech, Greta Thunberg, Our House is on Fire. Um, so Those these were, were <laughs> well, like, so they're ideologically uh, activated, but in terms of uh, like violent oh, self okay. Okay. sacrifice, okay. ideologically extreme, like the comparison group matters, right? Anders Breivik, Elliot sure. Rogers. Okay. Okay. Versus... <laughs> these, There's so... not a lot of shoot people in I Have a Dream Speech, I'll give you that. Yeah, so... Um, so anyway, there's a lot, there's a, a large amount. Okay, I found my notes from earlier. When you're looking for oral, A-U-R-A-L, excitement, is it easier to find that with an extreme podcast rather than a moderate one? I know that I have an unhealthy addiction to excitement. And I find it a lot easier to get excited about more extreme stuff. Now, didn't S apply sing about I can't get excited? Oh, they even, they even did, they did a song. I mean... Every profound thought has been encapsulated in an air supply song. Ever, ever since feeling now would take my life into a year ago, you say you love me again. I cannot say what I cannot do. It's been too long without someone. How could you let me sink this far away from you? Now you're here wondering why you can't get near. I can't get excited. Can't get excited. There's a thousand things to do. I can't do anything with you. I can't get excited. Can't get excited. You can see me look right through. I don't feel like I used to. I can't get excited. Of uh, text there, right? And and then the question is, okay, so how do you look at it? And there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it. You could you could do it qualitatively, just read them all, detect themes, and and kind of character. Okay, a friend says, if you like ideas, won't that lead you to extremities? Because that is what is novel. So I'm always excited about some idea, and <laughs> they change week to week, day to day, month to month, year to year. Because I'm not married, I don't have a family, so I'm probably you know more vulnerable to my changing intellectual forms of excitement. I'm, to the extent I'm ideological, I, to the extent I'm intellectual, I'm an intellectual, what is it? I don't want to, what's that David Lee Roth song? Oh, I'm an intellectual gigolo. Like I'm, I'm always falling in love with, some new pretty exciting idea, but ultimately staying staying loyal to none, to none. If you prefer thinking in terms of your family, your people, your interests, you won't necessarily be perhaps as radical. If you're interested in people, you might get immune to a degree from fringe ideas. Yeah, so I think if you're connected to your family, friends, community, you're much less likely to to be extreme and antisocial. The rise, you know, qualitatively, what is, I think that's called. yeah, what 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 you see there, um, and <laughs> you can you can also see if people uh, detect the same. So Elliot Black completely resonates with that Air Supply song. I can't get excited. It pretty much you know, summarizes this this feeling of ennui, which has washed over him at times. Elliot says, a moderate podcast seems like wallpaper, pleasant, but ultimately uninteresting. That's why you need to go for the more extreme stuff like Embrace the Void with Aaron Rabinowitz, the left-wing atheist philosopher here talking with another left-wing atheist, Chris Kavanaugh. Themes, right? So it, 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 one mm -hmm. thing which you might want to do with content analysis is give people a set of 
uh, categories and then ask them to code material into that categories. You can code for the absence or presence of it, or you can you know, uh, see which category they put stuff into. Um, and you could do that with relevant experts, or you could do this with uh, coders that you train on your like naive coders, so to speak, not experts, but people who you gave your coding rubric to and say, sure. code this material. And then you can look, do they agree with each other? Right? The, how reliable is the coding uh, amongst, say, compared between experts and non-experts? Um, and indeed, we did this. So uh, we did, uh, Julia, I should say primarily, did the qualitative uh, assessment of the manifestos and and then recruited experts to code like m material um, selected from that to see if they identify the same categories and and then uh, non experts twen uh, twenty odd non experts and compare their codings with the ones that are already there so that that's one set of analyses which is I think in the paper that you looked at and then we also did uh... so do you think America is ready to overcome its homophobia and elect a, you know a gay man like a Tim Scott or Cory Booker, president of the United States? Uh, statistical analysis, like giving, feeding into a, you know, a, a kind of data analysis software, uh, the linguistic codes that we have and the full text, and then asking it to categorize the content, the relative proportions in the different um, content. Mm. And then, you know, also taking out uh, the stuff which it has categorized and checking, but is this coherent? Did it select like mm -hmm. reasonable mm -hmm. uh, things in those categories? <laughs> so. For folks who want to understand how science works, I'm remembering the, the DM conversation now that we had where you were like, how do I describe any of this in my text? Like, what <laughs> oh. words would you use? What things would you block out? <laughs> like, how many strings of slurs would you include in your peer reviewed materials? Yeah, there's a lot in... So, yeah, like because... There's, there's, question, how would you phrase this? <laughs> there's a lot of slurs, right? Yeah. Especially... So, the, one, this is not... So, we did this with manifestos, but then we also looked at uh, kind of logs of conversations, uh, chat logs or Discord uh, text logs for various different QAnon. Um, yeah, how many N-words, how many K-words, you know, how many racial slurs would you include in your peer-reviewed academic article on the language of terrorism? Groups. You're all fair Nazis, you know. What yeah, so, so there's a lot of stuff in there that isn't, um, you know, particularly nice. A lot of slurs um, and, and whatnot. And so if you're describing what you would count as like, you know, derogatory slurs or outgroup dehumanization, you have to use the language that they use or you have to represent it somewhere. Um, but the question is like, do you put it in the paper? How many stars do you put in the paper? You know, to, to, uh, so the, yeah, that was just- a, And debates I, about I, like, is it bad to like hide that stuff? Is it better? Like, is it whitewashing if you put it in the appendix? Should it be- And, and there are certain slurs which seem <laughs> like more acceptable or you feel less- <laughs> There's a word you can't say, that's the worst <laughs> word, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, then you're like, it's well, but we can't exclude it for one group and then allow the slurs for other groups. So yeah, it's it, that that was that was uh, an, an issue, um, and we went with that we would provide warnings and then represent it, right? And we'll see. Sure, what did you? Uh, well, we, all the scientific evidence against their efficacy. Yeah, well, mainly uh, I would say a little bit ours covering <laughs> to say sure. we're going to include these. Like but, a classic you know, neoliberal shield course. I'm <laughs> yeah. just doing it so you don't get sued. Yeah, so so that's what we did, and we looked at. And I would say as well, just one note here is that. I personally, I, my co-authors might disagree with this, but like I regard uh, the, whatever particular theoretical model that you're arguing for or that, you know, you do the analysis and you say, well, these factors seem to be uh, like more recurrent or whatever. I'm actually like pretty agnostic about which model is the best. Like if mm -hmm. people run a whole bunch of analysis with additional data sets and they find out that it's other predictors which are more commonly associated, mm -hmm. right? Or you add in other linguistic corpuses and the things that we highlighted actually turn out to be like less significant. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I, my general thing is that science and, and efforts, especially to quantify and triangulate things, it just has to be transparent. It has to be, you have to put all of the stuff out so that other people can apply the analyses. And I would like to see, for example, um, more tests done with material that is ideologically strong, but not uh, regarded as like harmful, right? Because like say kinship language, I think you would find that kind of thing in a lot of, uh, you know, groups that people have no issue with, uh, in including, you know, like human yeah. rights organizations and stuff. So, or, yeah. or just religious groups that- um, Right. Well, it seems like almost know. all communities are running on it to some degree. Like that's the basic hardware, like the basic software of a community is interpersonal relationships. Um, yeah. I wanna, yeah. yeah, I wanna actually talk specifically about one example of that, but let me just ask while we're talking methods, Counter examples, like theoretically, you should be going out there trying to disprove your theory because that's what good science looks like. Because falsification is the gold standard, or something. I don't understand science. Um, <laughs> just part of it. Yes. Just because of all the Koreans now. Um, the like, how do you look for disconfirming examples? So philosophy, <laughs> philosophers, philosophy tends not to be an academic discipline that gets a lot of respect. They, they, philosophers tend to be late to the party. 
because they usually start with analysis of their own feelings and then trying to impose their own feelings on reality rather than beginning with social science. So this is a philosopher admitting, you know, he doesn't really know how to do science samples like do you guys go out and find you folks go out and find like communities that meet the three criteria you described but seem to never produce violent action and like you know are there are there groups like that out there or is it possible to look for something like that yes i think it it, it is there's like there's a kind of endless amount of groups that you can look at and i i think you do need to look like before you want would draw any really strong conclusions you would want to do what you're talking about which is like uh look for groups that that fit the characteristics, um, but but aren't associated with violence, and just do all of the same analyses and see how. So th that's the big problem with all these arguments and academic studies that uh, you know verbal violence leads to real world violence, because you can find ten thousand examples of verbal violence being used without you know physical violence accompanying it. So to whatever extent there is a connection between verbal violence and physical violence, it's quite remote, and when you know, one group goes to a war with another group, it's usually because of visceral, real world, intense, extreme conflicts of interest between groups. That's what leads to, you know, one group trying to slaughter another group. And it's not because of things they heard on the radio. Uh, like what, what level the indicators are at. Now, we did do this to a certain extent. Like I said, we had free, mm. uh, you know, moderate in a certain sense, um, like, texts that we compare the manifestos to, but that's only three, right? And two of them are speeches. So that's mm -hmm. important difference there. Um, also, when we looked at the QAnon groups, uh, we had, uh, I think it was uh, 11 or so groups, maybe more, but we we did look at um, some comparison groups. A non-violent uh, control group was uh, this, the third R, um, kind of a, a religious community, right? But mm -hmm. one that, that we had like an extensive uh, chat log with. And then a... Um, a violent control group, Iron March, like, you know, kind of neo-Nazi group. Mm. So there are, and, and also we, from the QAnon groups that we looked at, there's a, there's groups which are much less extreme than others, right? They're, they're more like conspiracy oriented. So it isn't like we have a, a table in it that based on our like kind of indicators, fusion plus threat plus calls to violence and an estimated violence risk. And we, we did find channels that were low uh, on those indicators or medium, right? There was only uh, one that was very high and um, from the mm. ones that we looked at. So it, it's important to note, I think that, you know, QAnon and like, if you listen to QAnon Anonymous, right, there's so many different uh, subgroups within that broad movement. And there's people with like differing degrees of interest in it and devotion to it. And you're always going to have some who are more ideologically extreme and you, and you will have uh, subgroups which are like more cultish and, and that yeah. kind of thing. So I, I think it's important when talking about it, like to kind of keep that in mind that especially yeah, if you're talking about movements with millions of people that they're not all, you know, potential violent terrorists. Right. And I would also assume this analysis would apply to a lot of kinds of like all behavior to some extent, not just like you're interested in violent extremism. But if you swap violent extremism out for anti-vaxxerism, that you'd find yep. similar trends that like anti-vax, like, you know, think of um, uh, ultra Hasidic communities, right? They're going to be really high on this and are more susceptible to that kind of thing. Yeah. And you could I do question, like, yeah, hold on. Atten I, wanna, I mean, yeah. just stuff like attendance to rallies, donations to, right. you know, like donations sure. to political candidates or whatever. And I, I would say, Aaron, that uh, one thing that I suggested is like, you would want to look at these kind of indicators in anti-fascist groups, right? Because sure. I'd be curious what you would see. Um, I bet you actually would see mixed results because I think the left is really bad at interpersonal relationships. And so, <laughs> so, no, I really, I'm, I'm not kidding. I really do think that we are bad at what you are describing here. I think. No. So I, I talk for, for years on how the right is really bad at interpersonal relationships. So here's this left-wing philosopher, Aaron Rabinowitz, talking about how the left is really bad at interpersonal relationships. Oh, that's, I, I, I would I, agree. Identity via ideas, much worse than identity via persons. Um, but, yeah, so this is yeah. about, you know, like the language of comrades and uh, that kind of thing. I'm not saying sure, it, all, sure. it all falls yeah. in that. Like we said, you know, kinship kind of stuff is just, it's like, it's it's fairly common across a whole bunch of stuff. But it's like, more effective in certain communities, maybe, or their language is better. Like, like oh, the comrade stuff doesn't instill in me a sense of obligation in the same way that I think that like fundamentalist Christians really, really feel that community connection. But let me ask you about what seems to be the obvious pick, which is why are, have you I'm like i'm jumping the gun here i apologize and i'll have you back on when you publish but why aren't you applying this to the gurus here doesn't it seem like all of that interpersonal stuff you described in the first half of you know and you're talking about how they are obsessed with these interpersonal relationships like it sounds like they're doing exactly what you're describing here and that it might mean that they are creating a higher that like, could explain why there's a higher risk of conspiracism in their community well that's interesting yeah so uh i think partly it is that um so you definitely get the perception of threat right and the the kind sure. of 
the vast conspiracy of evil forces which are targeting you. You also get the like the strong in group out group I, markers, right? You are part of this elect, and and we are a uh, you know like a brothership of of light or whatever you. But I think one issue there is that the power of sociality is more focused on the kind of guru figure, right, and consuming the their content, and that that means it's probably mm -hmm. uh -huh. more closer in line to like cultish dynamics as opposed to like extremist so building, like interpersonal communities where you hang out and talk about Jordan Peterson as much with some of it but it's like it's not yeah. together as strongly as these other kinds of communities and then it's lacking definitely in most cases the the endorsements of violence or calls to violence now Alex Jones for example would be different than that right because I think he is creating all of these things along with very you know, like uh, subtle is not is doing them too much, <laughs> like lending right. them too much credibility. He is calling to violence often on his well, how much, show. How much are y'all looking at implicit calls to violence versus explicit? Because I feel like if you look at your James Lindsay's of the IDW, right, who I still think should be, you know, part, considered part of this, even if they have been effectively excised at the moment. Um, we saw how that's gone with Nawaz, right? Like, hmm. uh, you know, I don't know that James ever explicitly said go murder a bunch of globalists, but he certainly has built a case for it in a very substantial way. And I think we all like understand the idea that a lot of stochastic terrorism doesn't, it's not at any level built on someone explicitly saying go rid me of these meddling priests, right? It's very much like these people are an existential threat to everything you love. What are you going to do about a question mark? Right, right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was just listening to um, there's a podcast called Some Dare Call It Conspiracy, um, and it's it's doing a multi-part series on the um, Pizzagate conspiracy, right? And they played a clip from Infowars mm -hmm. where Owen Troyer was talking about Comet Ping Pong, and very much it wasn't it wasn't subtle. It was someone needs to go there, somebody you know needs to stand up for what's right. If you go there, you'll be saving people. Look in the and and Infowars have scrubbed that now from you know for obvious reasons right. but, but even I, that is an explicit violence right like he's just saying go there he's not saying go there and kill anyone he's saying just go there no but like alex jones is also saying you know we need to take care of this and then like but then there, there's always the disclaimers and stuff added in and i i do think like so one issue would be that there's the problem that calls to violence are actually sort of relatively common right like that sure. you you do see people uh, endorsing them or you know kind of saying that we need to noise the time like it's we and and so the explicit endorsement of violence, although it's not acceptable, like on lots of things to do it outright, but but it's still there. But, that, but that's the problem is like because that signal is there on its own. It, in most occasions, it doesn't lead to anything, right? Well, Even can you have like an easier time then, like focusing on anti-vaxxer, for example, where people feel like they can be openly anti-vaxxer right now, and you could study like how much well, like, anti-vaxxers and picking up in certain communities like that. Yeah, so but that's the kind of thing that I, I well, I, I do think it would be interesting to look at anti-vax uh, sentiment, but like I, I would say that a whole bunch of you know, violent conspiracy theorists, they are anti-vaxxers as, as sure. well, right? Like, there's, there's so they're going to be overlaps. Yeah. Um, yeah so I I, think there's overlaps between the anti-vaxxers and the QAnon in the sense that it's often these online communities that are baking, you know, together, right? When you bake together, it seems like you, you're you building these interpersonal relationships. So my, my feeling with the anti-vax stuff, and this, again, this is ill-formed thoughts, right? But just my initial reaction is like the anti-vax sentiment is often a kind of stepping stone to the bigger conspiracy, right? Because you're first saying the mm -hmm. vaccines don't work, it's the pharmaceutical companies, but then there's always the step to who controls the pharmaceutical companies. It's the WEF grit reset. Yeah, I think this is true. So let's see the trajectory of many of the anti-vaccine people in our community. Gender, right? Yeah. It's well, guilty, you know my it's... view that, like, as soon as, like, I do think as soon as you start down a like they big they rabbit hole, like, <laughs> there's, there's it, it's impossible to not let everything <laughs> in the door, right? It's like you know your your epistemology becomes such that it's difficult to discount the other ones. Um, yeah, and and often those are people with little hats <laughs> that, right. that are yes. uh, ultimately uh, yes. right. Right, the hats get smaller and smaller until they just fit <laughs> on the back of your head, and then then you solve the question of who's causing all the problems. So, but, uh, but that's the that's the point to me a little bit is that you, so. If you were looking at anti-vax communities or whatnot, that you you won't get. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you will get some groups where it's more moderate and there's, there's kind of just like contrarian doctors. But I think the more that you get into the hardcore anti-vax stuff, it gets into the melange of like uh, you know the the kind of conspiracism that you see in QAnon that you previously saw in militia communities and and so on. Like there, so and and that yeah. I wonder because like, I mean, like you can get it that people you know attack abortion clinics, right? So it's not sure. like. You can't and I was have... worried that people were going to attack um like vaccine... uh, COVID vaccine places, and it seems like yeah. it hasn't happened. Thankfully, um, I, I, know well, at least, I wouldn't be surprised. Degree. But like you, it wouldn't have been a shock had it have happened, right? And it's it, a very seemed... plausible soft target. It seems like um, yeah. we're a little over time, so I'm running late here. I do want to ask a little bit. Like, is there anything applicable at this point in this research that we can like use to actually help people reduce risk, or are we mostly just still trying to like map causes and then hopefully be able to influence them to some degree? Well, I think the general, with this kind of material, I, I think Julia is probably more directly involved with, you know, like counterterrorism efforts and that kind of thing. And those organizations are always 
attempting to look for you know stuff that they can flag up material and, and that's an issue you got a lot of recorded right? language that they want to analyze is what you're saying you know right they need some new technologies eh? right so th that and that's a concern right like because you you have to factor in that people whatever disclaimers you put in people may just go well okay let's just apply this corpus and say the anybody who flags up these free things causes danger so i i think it's important to emphasize that like all the the kind of work that we have done here and these these models they have to be considered alongside you know like deep qualitative analysis and that they they shouldn't be treated as like they're more scientifically rigorous right like it should be mm -hmm. i i would want to emphasize that these are i think using linguistic analysis and this kind of stuff we should be doing it and we should be uh like the, the material is our people are you know going to do it in in any case and like the tools to to be able to do it are getting better um, and there's a lot of conspiracism and extremism around so you know analytical tools for doing it are important but i i'm wary about people applying like simplistic models or becoming theoretically devoted to you know a specific mm -hmm. set of predictors and like i i prefer to emphasize like a, a triangulation approach um, but but one that that takes like linguistic analysis serious so so yeah i'm, I'm pretty there's a very woke uh, qualitative position I, I appreciate that you have adopted that and acknowledged it openly here um yeah i just don't want to be <laughs> end up <laughs> like be somebody getting you know flagged up on a terrorist watch list sure. or something because sure. they they talked about their brothers in a struggle or something um but would be a deep yeah. irony given your heritage wouldn't it um, <laughs> yes it, it, it would so yeah can, but... Yes, but you have been a very amicable irishman i do appreciate it um speaking of overly simplistic models though i do unfortunately have to torture you before we get on to the bonus times so you're familiar this is a, a great part of this embrace the void philosophy podcast here i love what he does next it this works but this is the enlightening round enlightenment comes from within and for folks who are not familiar i'm going to give you a list of things you are going to tell me are these things real or not real um this will make you sad and everyone will laugh and that'll be fun um are you ready yeah though i've done it once before so doesn't that mean like or, i'm it's pretty new ones now it's new oh ones it's now. new ones oh bugger because yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah no, we're just going to be over new things now so you're gonna have to and some of these are gonna be particularly tricky for you given the work that you do so i'm excited to hear your thoughts on this mm. um so first of all i always have to check at this point is anything real yeah all right so let's code real or not real with no notes uh bodies real or not real real okay minds real or not real real <laughs> i have to tell you the face he's making is impressive uh free will oh real <laughs> wow good, we know those sales fast uh luck um real <laughs> i guess it's real <laughs> demons not real oh afterlife not real <laughs> truth real beauty yeah real <laughs> justice real real yeah not no not real not real kind of real not real. Uh, real. Not real not real all right not real okay and finally hope well i said justice no, i guess not real then <laughs> all right you have survived how do you feel uh not good <laughs> not good i was all feeling bottom about how the first round yeah yeah that was easy up till when i detected my obvious contradictions <laughs> and then they sent me as always fun i like that you with very little equivocation or attempts to use real or not real still conveyed a wide range of emotions you really <laughs> went from happy to very sad to back to happy for a second on demons and then way way down into sad which is pretty funny i i think it's interesting you could do a study aaron in the reactions that you get to this because i particularly enjoy when you do this activity with people who are you know maybe somewhat more suspicious of you or less agreeable than i am sure. and they obviously regarded as like a trap <laughs> so, and so they're or the, <laughs> the people who, trap want, of all time. who want to qualify it, you know you you explain the rules i'm a rule based guy you know you say yeah you're this or that. but but all the people are like each answer gets a large explanation like you'll get to do that that's that's why it's hard so anyway i'm just complaining about your other guests not me <laughs> <laughs> no it's good i'm glad you're picking fights with my other guests i love that love that that's a, a great great uh, series of questions for for a podcast I, I love that real or not real mind body hope truth justice love afterlife demons a uh, great series of questions there andrew Aaron, Aaron Rabinowitz, the left-wing philosopher. That's it for me. Take care. Bye-bye.